Chapter Thirty One of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Yunnan in China, from the clattering bright bazaars, crept something invisible in the sun and vigilant by dark, creeping, sinister, ceaseless, creeping across the Himalayas, down through walled market places, across a desert along hot yellow rivers, into an American missionary compound, creeping, silent, sure. And here and there, on its way, a man was black and stilled with plague. In Bombay, a new dock guard, unaware of things, spoke boisterously over his family rice of a strange new custom of the rats. Those princes of the sewer, swift to dart and turn, had gone mad, they came out on the warehouse floor, ignoring the guard, springing up as though, the guard said merrily, they were trying to fly, and straightway falling dead. He had poked at them, but they did not move. Three days later, that dock guard died of the plague. Before he died, from his dock, a ship with a cargo of wheat steamed off to Marseille. There was no sickness on it all the way. There was no reason why at Marseilles it should not lie next to a tramp steamer, nor why that steamer, pitching down to Montevideo, with nothing more sensational than a discussion between the supercargo and the second officer in the matter of a fifth ace, should not berth near the S.S. Pendown Castle, bound for the island of St. Hubert, to add cocoa to its present cargo of lumber. On the way to St. Hubert, a Goanese seedy boy, and after him the mess-room steward on the Pendown Castle, died of what the skipper called influenza. A greater trouble was the number of rats which, ill-satisfied with lumber as diet, scampered up to the food stores, then into the forecastle, and for no reason perceptible, died on the open decks. They danced comically before they died, and lay in the scuppers, stark and ruffled. So the Pendown Castle came to Blackwater, the capital and port of St. Hubert. It is a little isle of the southern West Indies, but St. Hubert supports a hundred thousand people, English planters and clerks, Hindu roadmakers, Negro cane hands, Chinese merchants. There is history along its sands and peaks. Here the buccaneers careened their ships. Here the Marques of Wimsbury, when he had gone mad, took to repairing clocks and bade his slaves burn all the sugar cane. Hither that peasant beau, Gaston Lopo, brought Madame de Merlemont, and dwelt in fashionableness, till the slaves, whom he had often relished to lash, came on him shaving, and straightway the lather was fantastically smeared with blood. Today, St. Hubert is all sugar cane and Ford cars, oranges and plantains, and the red and yellow pods of cocoa, bananas, and rubber trees, and jungles of bamboo, Anglican churches, and tin chapels, colored washerwomen busy at the hollows in the roots of silk cotton trees, steamy heat and royal palms, and the immortelle that fills the valleys with crimson. Today it is all splendor and tourist dullness, and cabled cane quotations against the unsparing sun. Blackwater, flat and breathless town of tin-roofed plaster houses and incandescent bone-white roads, of salmon-red hibiscus and balconied stores, whose dark depths open without barrier from the stifling streets, has the harbor to one side and a swamp to the other but behind it are the Penrith Hills, on whose wholesome and palm-softened heights is Government House, looking to the winking sails. Here lived in bulky torpor His Excellency, the Governor of St. Hubert, Colonel Sir Robert Fairlamb. Sir Robert Fairlamb was an excellent fellow, a teller of mess-room stories, one who in a heathen day never smoked till the port had gone seven times round but he was an execrable governor and a worried governor. The man whose social rank was next to his own, the Honorable Cecil Eric George Twyford, a lean, active, high-nosed despot who owned and knew rod by snake-writhing rod, 
some ten thousand acres of cane in St. Swithin's parish, Twyford said that His Excellency was a potty and snoring fool, and versions of the opinion came not too slowly to Fairlam. Then, to destroy him complete, the House of Assembly, which is the St. Hubert legislature, was riven by the feud of Kellett the Red Leg and George William Vertigan. The Red Legs were a tribe of Scotch-Irish poor whites who had come to St. Hubert as indentured servants two hundred years before. Most of them were still fishermen and plantation foremen, but one of them, Kellett, a man small-mouthed and angry and industrious, had risen from office boy to owner of a shipping company, and while his father still spread his nets on the beach at Point Carib, Kellett was the scourge of the House of Assembly and a hound for economy, particularly any economy which would annoy his fellow legislator, George William Vertigan. George William, who was sometimes known as Old Geo Wim, and sometimes as the King of the Ice House, that enticing and ruinous bar, had been born behind a little Bethel in Lancashire. He owned the Blue Bazaar, the hugest stores in St. Hubert. He caused tobacco to be smuggled into Venezuela. He was as full of song and incaution and rum as Kellett the Red Leg was full of figures and envy and decency. Between them, Kellett and George William split the House of Assembly. There could be, to a respectable person, no question as to their merits. Kellett, the just and earnest man of domesticity, whose rise was an inspiration to youth. George William, the gambler, the lusher, the smuggler, the liar, the seller of shoddy cottons, a person whose only excellence was his cheap good nature. Kellett's first triumph in economy was to pass an ordinance removing the melancholy Cockney, a player of oboes, who was the official rat-catcher of St. Hubert. George William Vertigan insisted in debate, and afterward privily to Sir Robert Fairlam, that rats destroy food and perhaps spread disease, and His Excellency must veto the bill. Sir Robert was troubled. He called in the Surgeon General, Dr. R. E. Inchcape Jones, but he preferred to be called Mr., not Doctor. Dr. Inchcape Jones was a thin, tall, fretful, youngish man without bowels. He came out from home only two years before and he wanted to go back home, to that particular part of home, represented by tennis tees in Surrey. He remarked to Sir Robert that rats and their ever-faithful fleas do carry diseases, plague and infectious jaundice, and rat-bite fever, and possibly leprosy, but these diseases did not, and therefore could not, exist in St. Hubert except for leprosy, which was a natural punishment of outlandish native races. In fact, noted Inchcape Jones, nothing did exist in St. Hubert, except malaria, deng, and a general beastly dullness, and if red legs like Kellett longed to die of plague and rat-bite fever, why should decent people object? So, by the sovereign power of the House of Assembly of St. Hubert, and of His Excellency the Governor, the cockney rat-catcher, and his jiggling young coloured assistant, were commanded to cease to exist. The rat-catcher became a chauffeur. He drove Canadian and American tourists, who stopped at St. Hubert for a day or two, between Barbados and Trinidad, along such hill-trails as he considered most easy to achieve with a second-hand motor, and gave them misinformation regarding the flowers. The rat-catcher's assistant became a respectable smuggler and leader of a Wesleyan choir. And as for the rats themselves, they flourished, they were glad in the land, and each female produced from ten to two hundred offspring every year. They were not often seen by day. "'The rats aren't increasing, the cats kill em, said Kellett, the red leg but by darkness they gambled in the warehouses and in and out of the schooners along the quay. They ventured countryward and lent their fleas to a species of ground squirrels which were plentiful about the village of Carib. A year and a half after the removal of the rat-catcher, 
when the Pendown Castle came in from Montevideo and moored by the Councilor Pier, it was observed by ten thousand glinty small eyes among the piles. As a matter of routine, certainly not as a thing connected with the deaths from what the skipper had called influenza, the crew of the Pendown Castle put rat shields on the mooring hawsers, but they did not take up the gangplank at night, and now and then a rat slithered ashore to find among its kin in black water more unctuous fare than hardwood lumber. The Pendown sailed amiably for home, and from Avonmouth came to Surgeon General Inchcape Jones a cable announcing that the ship was held, that others of the crew had died, and died of plague. In the curt cablegram, the word seemed written in bone-scorching fire. Two days before the cable came, a blackwater lighter man had been smitten by an unknown ill, very unpleasant, with delirium and buboes. Inchcape Jones said that it could not be plague, because there never was plague in St. Hubert. His confrere, Stokes, retorted that perhaps it couldn't be plague, but it damn well was plague. Dr. Stokes was a wiry, humorless man, the parish medical officer of St. Swithin Parish. He did not remain in the rustic reaches of St. Swithin, where he belonged, but snooped all over the island, annoying Inchcape Jones. He was an M.B. of Edinburgh. He had served in the African bush. He had had blackwater fever and cholera, and most other reasonable afflictions. And he had come to St. Hubert only to recover his red blood corpuscles and to disturb the unhappy Inchcape Jones. He was not a nice man. He had beaten Inchcape Jones at tennis with a nasty, unsporting serve, the sort of serve you'd expect from an American. And this Stokes, rather a bounder, a frightful bore, fancied himself as an amateur bacteriologist. It was a bit thick to have him creeping about the docks, catching rats, making cultures from the bellies of their fleas, and barging in, sandy-headed and red-faced, thin and unpleasant, to insist that they bore plague. "'My dear fellow, there's always some bacillus pestis among rats,' said Inchcape Jones, in a kindly but airy way. When the lighter man died, Stokes irritatingly demanded that it be openly admitted that the plague had come to St. Hubert. Even if it was plague, which is not certain, said Inchcape Jones, there's no reason to cause a row and frighten everybody. It was a sporadic case. There won't be any more. There was more, immediately. In a week, three other waterfront workers and a fisherman at Point Carib were down with something which, even Inchcape Jones acknowledged, was uncomfortably like the description of plague in Manson's Tropical Diseases, a prodromal stage characterized by depression, anorexia, aching of the limbs, then the fever, the vertigo, the haggard features, the bloodshot and sunken eyes, the buboes in the groin. It was not a pretty disease. Inchcape Jones ceased being chattery and ever so jolly about picnics, and became almost as grim as Stokes, but publicly he still hoped and denied, and St. Hubert did not know, did not know. Part Two To drinking men and wanderers, the pleasantest place in the rather dull and tin-roofed town of Blackwater, is the bar and restaurant called the Ice House. It is on the floor above the Kellett Shipping Agency, and the shop where the Chinaman, who is supposed to be a graduate of Oxford, sells carved tortoise and coconuts in the horrible likeness of a head shrunken by headhunters. Except for the balcony, where one lunches and looks down on squatting breech-clouded Hindu beggars and unearthly pearl-pale English children at games in the savannah, all of the ice house is a large and dreaming dimness wherein you are but half conscious of moorish grills, a touch of gilt on white painted walls, a heavy, amazingly long mahogany bar, slot machines, and marble topped tables beyond your own. Here at the cocktail hour are all the bloodless, sun helmeted white rulers of St. Hubert, who haven't quite the caste to belong to the Devonshire Club. 
the shipping office clerks, the merchants who have no grandfathers, the secretaries to the Inch Cape Joneses, the Italians and Portuguese who smuggle into Venezuela. Calmed by rum swizzles, those tart and commanding aperitifs, which are made in their deadly perfection only by the twirling swizzle sticks of the darkies at the ice-house bar, the exiles become peaceful, and have another swizzle, and grow certain again, as for twenty-four hours, since the last cocktail hour, they have not been certain, that next year they will go home. Yes, they will taper off, take exercise in the dawn coolness, stop drinking, become strong and successful, and go home the lotus-eaters, tears in their eyes when in the dimness of the ice-house they think of Piccadilly or the heights of Quebec, of Indiana or Catalonia or the clogs of Lancashire. They never go home, but always they have new reassuring cocktail hours at the ice-house until they die, and the other lost men come to their funerals and whisper one to another that they are going home. Now of the ice-house, George William Vertigan, owner of the Blue Bazaar, was unchallenged monarch. He was a thick, ruddy man, the sort of Englishman one sees in the Midlands, the sort that is either very nonconformist or very alcoholic, and George William was not nonconformist. Each day, from five to seven, he was tilted against the bar, never drunk, never altogether sober, always full of melody and kindliness the one man who did not long for home, because, outside the ice-house, he remembered no home. When it was whispered that a man had died of something which might be plague, George William announced to his court that if it were true, it would serve Kellett the red leg jolly well right. But everyone knew that the West Indian climate prevented plague. The group, quivering on the edge of being panicky, were reassured. It was two nights afterward that there writhed into the ice-house a rumor that George William Vertigan was dead. Part 3 No one dared speak of it, whether in the Devonshire Club, or the ice-house, or the breeze-fluttered, sea-washed park, where the negroes gather after working hours, but they heard, almost without hearing, of this death, and this, and another. No one liked to shake hands with his oldest friend. Everyone fled from everyone else, though the rats loyally stayed with them. And through the island galloped the panic, which is more murderous than its brother, the plague. Still there was no quarantine, no official admission. Inchcape Jones vomited feeble proclamations on the inadvisability of two large public gatherings, and wrote to London to inquire about half-kinds prophylactic, but to Sir Robert Fairlamb he protested, "'Honestly, there's only been a few deaths, and I think it's all passed over. As for these suggestions of Stokes, that we burn the village of Carib, merely because they've had several cases, why, it's barbarous!' and it's been conveyed to me that if we were to establish a quarantine, the merchants would take the strongest measures against the administration. It would ruin the tourist and export business. But Stokes of St. Swithin's secretly wrote to Dr. Max Gottlieb, director of the McGurk Institute, that the plague was ready to flare up and consume all the West Indies, and would Dr. Gottlieb do something about it? End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。There may have been in the shadowy heart of Max Gottlieb a diabolic insensibility to divine pity, to suffering humankind. There may have been resentment of the doctors who considered his science of value only as it was handy to advertising their business of healing. There may have been the obscure and passionate and unscrupulous demand of genius for privacy. Certainly, he who had lived to study the methods of immunizing mankind against disease had little interest in actually using those methods. He was like a fabulous painter so contemptuous of popular taste, that after a lifetime of creation, 
he should destroy everything he had done, lest it be marred and mocked by the dull eyes of the crowd. The letter from Dr. Stokes was not his only intimation that plague was striding through St. Hubert, that tomorrow it might be leaping to Barbados, to the Virgin Islands, to New York. Ross McGurk was an emperor of the new era, better served than any cloistered satrap of old. His skippers looked in at a hundred ports, his railroads penetrated jungles, his correspondents whispered to him of the next election in Colombia, of the Cuban cane crop, of what Sir Robert Fairlam had said to Dr. R. E. Inchcape Jones on his bungalow porch. Ross McGurk and after him Max Gottlieb knew better than did the lotus eaters of the ice house how much plague there was in St. Hubert. Yet Gottlieb did not move, but pondered the unknown chemical structure of antibodies, interrupted by questions as to whether Pearl Robbins had enough pencils, whether it would be quite all right for Dr. Holabird to receive the lettish scientific mission this afternoon, so that Dr. Scholthes might attend the Anglican conference on the reservation of the host. He was assailed by inquirers, public health officials, one Dr. Almas Pickerbaugh, a congressman who was said to be popular in Washington, Gustav Sondeleus, and a Martin Arrowsmith who could not, whether because he was too big or too small, quite attain Gottlieb's concentrated indifference. It was rumored that Arrowsmith of McGurk had something which might eradicate plague. Letters demanded of Gottlieb, Can you stand by with the stuff of salvation in your hands, and watch thousands of these unfortunate people dying in St. Hubert, and what is more, are you going to let the dreaded plague gain a foothold in the Western Hemisphere? My dear man, this is the time to come out of your scientific reverie and act. Then Ross McGurk, over a comfortable stake, hinted, not too diffidently, that this was the opportunity for the Institute to acquire world fame. Whether it was the compulsion of McGurk, or the demands of the public spirited, or whether Gottlieb's own imagination aroused enough to visualize the far-off misery of the blacks in the cane fields, he summoned Martin and remarked, It comes to me that there is pneumonic plague in Manchuria and bubonic in St. Hubert, in the West Indies. If I could trust you, Martin, to use the phage with only half your patience and keep the others as controls under normal hygienic conditions, but without the phage, then you could make an absolute determination of its value, as complete as what we have of mosquito transmission of yellow fever and then I would send you down to St. Hubert. What do you think? Martin swore by Jacques Loeb that he would observe test conditions. He would determine forever the value of Fage by the contrast between patients treated and untreated, and so, perhaps, end all plague forever. He would harden his heart and keep clear his eyes. We will get Sondeleus to go along, said Gottlieb. He will do the big boom-boom, and so bring us the credit in the newspapers which, I am now told, a director must obtain. Sondeleus did not merely consent, he insisted. Martin had never seen a foreign country. He could not think of Canada, where he had spent a vacation as hotel waiter, as foreign to him. He could not comprehend that he was really going to a place of palm trees and brown faces and languid Christmas eves. He was busy, while Sondeleus was out ordering linen suits and seeking a proper new sun helmet, making anti-plague fage on a large scale, a hundred liters of it, sealed in tiny ampules. He felt like the normal Martin, but conferences and powers were considering him. There was a meeting of the board of trustees to advise Martin and Sondeleus as to their methods. For it, the president of the University of Wilmington gave up a promising interview with a millionaire alumnus. Ross McGurk gave up a game of golf, and one of the three university scientists arrived by aeroplane. Called in from the laboratory, a rather young man in a wrinkled soft collar, dizzy still with the details of Erlenmeyer flasks, infusorial earth, and sterile filters, 
Martin was confronted by the men of measured merriment, and found that he was no longer concealed in the invisibility of insignificance, but regarded as a leader who was expected not only to produce miracles, but to explain beforehand how important and mature and miraculous he was. He was shy before the spectacled gravity of the five trustees as they sat, like a supreme court, at the dais table in Bonanza Hall, Gottlieb a little removed, also trying to look grave and supreme. But Sondaleus rolled in, enthusiastic and tremendous, and suddenly Martin was not shy, nor was he respectful to his one-time master in public health. Sondaleus wanted to exterminate all the rodents in St. Hubert, to enforce a quarantine, to use Yersin's serum and Hofkind's prophylactic, and to give Martin's Fage to everybody in St. Hubert, all at once, all with everybody. Martin protested. For the moment it might have been Gottlieb speaking. He knew, he flung at them, that humanitarian feeling would make it impossible to use the poor devils of sufferers as mere objects of experiment, but he must have at least a few real test cases, and he was damned, even before the trustees he was damned, if he would have his experiment so mucked up by multiple treatment that they could never tell whether the cures were due to Yersin or Hafkine or Fage or none of them. The trustees adopted his plan. After all, while they desired to save humanity, wasn't it better to have it saved by a McGurk representative than by a Yersin or Hafkine or the outlandish Sondaleus? It was agreed that if Martin could find in St. Hubert a district which was comparatively untouched by the plague, he should there endeavor to have test cases, one half injected with Fage, one half untreated. In the badly afflicted districts, he might give the Fage to everyone, and if the disease slackened unusually, that would be a secondary proof. Whether the St. Hubert government, since they had not asked for aid, would give Martin power to experiment and Sondaleus police authority, the trustees did not know. The Surgeon General, a chap named Inchcape Jones, had replied to their cables, No real epidemic, not need help but McGurk promised that he would pull his numerous wires to have the McGurk Commission, Chairman Martin Arrowsmith, B.A., M.D., welcomed by the authorities. Sondaleus still insisted that in this crisis mere experimentation was heartless, yet he listened to Martin's close-reasoned fury with enthusiasm which this bull-necked eternal child had for anything which sounded new and preferably true. He did not, like Almas Pickerbaugh, regard a difference of scientific opinion as an attack on his character. He talked of going on his own, independent of Martin and McGurk, but he was won back when the trustees murmured that though they really did wish the dear man wouldn't fool with Syra, they would provide him with apparatus to kill all the rats he wanted. Then Sondaleus was happy. And you watch me. I am the Captain General of Rat Killers. I used to walk into a warehouse, and the rats say, There's that damn old Uncle Gustav. What's the use? And they turn up their toes and die. I am used as glad I have you people behind me, because I am broke. I went and bought some oil stock that don't look so good now, and I shall need a lot of hydrocyanic acid gas. Oh, those rats! You watch me! Now I go and telegraph. I can't keep a lecture engagement next week. Huh. Me to lecture to a women's college. Me that can talk rat language and know seven beautiful deadly kind of traps. Part 2 Martin had never known greater peril than swimming a flood as a hospital intern. From waking to midnight, he was too busy making fage and receiving unsolicited advice from all the institute staff to think of the dangers of a plague epidemic. But when he went to bed, when his brain was still revolving with plans, he pictured rather too well the chance of dying unpleasantly. When Leora received the idea that he was going off to a death-haunted isle, to a place of strange ways and trees and faces, 
a place, probably, where they spoke funny languages and didn't have movies or toothpaste, she took the notion secretively away with her, to look at it and examine it, precisely as she often stole little foods from the table and hid them and meditatively ate them at odd hours of the night, with the pleased expression of a bad child. Martin was glad that she did not add to his qualms by worrying. Then, after three days, she spoke. "'I'm going with you.' "'You are not.' "'Well, I am.' "'It's not safe.' "'Silly, of course it is. You can shoot your nice old Fage into me, and then I'll be absolutely all right. Oh, I have a husband who cures things I have. I'm going to blow in a lot of money for thin dresses, though I bet St. Hubert isn't any hotter than Dakota can be in August. Listen, Lee, darling, listen. I do think the Fage will immunize against the plague. You bet I'll be mighty well injected with it myself. But I don't know and even if it were practically perfect, there'd always be some people it wouldn't protect. You simply can't go, sweet. Now I'm terribly sleepy. Leora seized his lapels, as comic fierce as a boxing kitten, but her eyes were not comic, nor her wailing voice, age-old wail of the soldier's women. Sandy, don't you know I haven't any life outside of you? I might have had, but honestly... I'll be glad to let you absorb me. I'm a lazy, useless, ignorant scut, except as maybe I can keep you comfortable. If you were off there, and I didn't know you were all right, or if you died, and somebody else cared for your body that I've loved so, haven't I loved it, dear? I'd go mad. I mean it. Can't you see I mean it? I'd go mad. It's just, I'm you, and I got to be with you, and I will help you make your media and everything. You know how often I've helped you. Oh, I'm not much good at McGurk, with all your awful complicated jiggers, but I did help you at Nautilus. I did help you, didn't I? And maybe in St. Hubert. Her voice was the voice of women in midnight terror. Maybe you won't find anybody that can help you, even my little bit, and I'll cook and everything. Darling, don't make it harder for me going to be hard enough in any case. Damn you, Sandy Arrowsmith! Don't you dare use those old stuck-up expressions that husbands have been drooling out to wives forever and ever. I'm not a wife any more than you're a husband. You're a rotten husband. You neglect me absolutely. The only time you know what I've gone on is when some doggone button slips, and how they can pull off when a person has gone over em and sewed em all on again is simply beyond me, and then you bawl me out. But I don't care. I'd rather have you than any decent husband. Besides, I'm going. Gottlieb opposed it. Sondaleus roared about it. Martin worried about it. But Leora went, and, his only act of craftiness as director of the Institute, Gottlieb made her secretary and technical assistant to the McGurk Plague and Bacteriophage Commission to the Lesser Antilles, and blandly gave her a salary. Part 3 The day before the commission sailed, Martin insisted that Sondaleus take his first injection of Fage. He refused. No, I will not touch it till you get converted to humanity, Martin, and give it to everybody in St. Hubert. And you will. Wait till you see them suffering by the thousand. You have not seen such a thing. Then you will forget science and try to save everybody. You shall not inject me till you will inject all my negro friends down there too. That afternoon Gottlieb called Martin in. He spoke with hesitation. You're off for Blackwater tomorrow. Yes, sir. Hmm. You may be gone some time. I... Martin, you are my oldest friend in New York. You and the good Miriam. Tell me, at first you and Terry taught I should not take up the directorship. Don't you now think I was wise? Martin stared. Then hastily he lied and said that which was comforting and expected. I am glad you think so. You have known so long what I have tried to do. I have faults, but I think I begin to see a real scientific note coming into the Institute at last. 
after the popularity chasing of Tubbs and Holabird. I wonder how I can discharge Holabird, that pants presser of science, if only he did not know Capitola so well. Socially, they call it. But anyway. There are those that said Max Gottlieb could not do the child's job of running an institution. Huh! Buying notebooks, hiring women that sweep floors. Oh no, the floors are swept by women hired by the superintendent of the building. Nishvar? But anyway. I did not make a rage when Terry and you doubted. I am a great fellow for allowing everyone his opinion. But it pleases me. I am very fond of you two boys, the only real sons I have. Gottlieb laid his withered hand on Martin's arm. It pleases me that you see now I am beginning to make a real scientific institute. Though I have enemies, Martin, you would think I was joking if I told you the plotting against me. Even Yeo. I taught he was my friend. I taught he was a real biologist. But just today he comes to me and says he cannot get enough sea urchins for his experiments. As if I could make sea urchins out of thin air. He said I keep him short of all materials. Me, that have always stood for... I do not care what they pay scientists, but always I have stood against that fool Silva in all of them, all of my enemies. You do not know how many enemies I have, Martin. They do not dare show their faces. They smile to me, but they whisper, I will show Hollabird. Always he plot against me and try to win over Pearl Robbins. But she is a good girl. She knows what I am doing, but... He looked perplexed. He peered at Martin as though he did not quite recognize him, and begged, Martin, I grow old. Not in years. It is a lie I am over seventy. But I have my worries. Do you mind if I give you advice, as I have done so often, so many years? Though you are not a schoolboy now in Queen City, no, at Winnemac it was. You are a man, and you are a genuine worker, but... Be sure you do not let anything, not even your own good kind heart, spoil your experiment at St. Hubert. I do not make funniness about humanitarianism, as I used to. Sometimes now I think the vulgar and contentious human race may yet have as much grace and good taste as the cats. But if this is to be, there must be knowledge. So many men, Martin, are kind and neighborly. So few have added to knowledge. You have the chance. You may be the man who ends all plague, and maybe old Max Gottlieb will have helped too. Hein, maybe? You must not be just a good doctor at St. Hubert. You must pity, oh, so much the generation after generation, yet to come, that you can refuse to let yourself indulge in pity for the men you will see dying. Dying. It will be peace. Let nothing, neither beautiful pity nor fear of your own death, keep you from making this plague experiment complete. And as my friend, if you do this, something will yet have come out of my directorship. But if one fine thing could come to justify me... When Martin came sorrowing into his laboratory, he found Terry Wicket waiting. Say, Slim, Terry blurted, just wanted to butt in and suggest, now for St. Gottlieb's sake, keep your Fage notes complete and up to date, and keep them in ink. Terry, it looks to me as if you thought I had a fine chance of not coming back with the notes myself. Aw, oh, what's biting you? said Terry feebly. Part 4 The epidemic in St. Hubert must have increased, for on the day before the McGurk Commission sailed, Dr. Inchcape Jones declared that the island was quarantined. People might come in, but no one could leave. He did this despite the fretting of the governor, Sir Robert Fairlam, and the protests of the hotel keepers who fed on tourists, the ex-rat catchers who drove the same, Kellett the red leg who sold them tickets, and all the other representatives of sound business in St. Hubert. Part 5 Besides his ampules of Fage and his Luer syringes for injection, Martin made personal preparations for the tropics. He bought, in seventeen minutes, a Palm Beach suit, two new shirts, and, as St. Hubert was a British possession, and as he had heard that all Britishers carry canes, a stick 
which the shopkeeper guaranteed to be as good as genuine Malacca. Part 6 They started, Martin and Leora, and Gustav Sondeleus, on a winter morning, on the 6,000-ton steamer St. Burian of the McGurk Line, which carried machinery and flour and codfish and motors to the Lesser Antilles, and brought back molasses, cocoa, avocados, Trinidad asphalt. A score of winter tourists made the round trip, but only a score, and there was little handkerchief waving. The McGurk Line Pier was in South Brooklyn, in a district of brown anonymous houses. The sky was colorless above dirty snow. Sondeleus seemed well content. As they drove upon a wharf littered with hides and boxes and disconsolate steerage passengers, he peered out of their crammed taxicab and announced that the bow of the St. Burian, all they could see of it, reminded him of the Spanish steamer he had taken to the Cape Verde Isles. But to Martin and Leora, who had read of the drama of departure, of stewards darting with masses of flowers, dukes and divorcees being interviewed, and bands playing the Star-Spangled Banner, the St. Burian was unromantic, and its fairy-like casualness was discouraging. Only Terry came to see them off, bringing a box of candy for Leora. Martin had never ridden a craft larger than a motor launch. He stared up at the black wall of the steamer's side. As they mounted the gangplank, he was conscious that he was cutting himself off from the safe, familiar land, and he was embarrassed by the indifference of more experienced-looking passengers staring down from the rail. Aboard, it seemed to him that the forward deck looked like the backyard of an old iron dealer, that the St. Burian leaned too much to one side, and that even in the dock she swayed undesirably. The whistle snorted contemptuously. The hawsers were cast off. Terry stood on the pier till the steamer, with Martin and Leora and Sondeleus above him, their stomachs pressed against the rail, had slid past him. Then he abruptly clumped away. Martin realized that he was off for the perilous sea and the perilous plague, that there was no possibility of leaving the ship till they should reach some distant island. This narrow deck, with its tarry lines between planks, was his only home. Also, in the breeze across the wide harbor, he was beastly cold, and in general, God help him. As the St. Burian was warped out into the river, as Martin was suggesting to his commission, how about going downstairs and seeing if we can raise a drink? There was the sound of a panicky taxicab on the pier, the sight of a lean, tall figure running, but so feebly, so shakily, and they realized that it was Max Gottlieb, peering for them, tentatively raising his thin arm in greeting, not finding them in the line at the rail, and turning sadly away. Part 7 As representatives of Ross McGurk and his various works, Evil and Benevolent, they had the two suites de luxe on the boat deck. Martin was cold off snow-blown Sandy Hook, sick off Cape Hatteras, and tired and relaxed between. With him Leora was cold, and in a ladylike manner she was sick, but she was not at all tired. She insisted on conveying information to him from the West Indian guidebook which she had earnestly bought. Sondeleus was conspicuously all over the ship. He had tea with the captain, scouse with the forecastle, and intellectual conferences with the negro missionary in the steerage. He was to be heard, always he was to be heard, singing on the promenade deck, defending Bolshevism against the boatswain, arguing oil burning with the first officer, and explaining to the bar steward how to make a gin sling. He held a party for the children in the steerage, and he borrowed from the first officer a volume of navigation to study between parties. He gave flavor to the ordinary cautious voyage of the St. Burian, but he made a mistake. He was courteous to Miss Gwilliam. He tried to cheer her on a seemingly lonely adventure. Miss Gwilliam came from one of the best families in her section of New Jersey. Her father was a lawyer and a church warden. Her grandfather had been a solid farmer. That she had not married, at thirty-three, 
was due entirely to the preference of modern young men for jazz dancing hussies, and she was not only a young lady of delicate reservations, but also a singer. In fact, she was going to the West Indies to preserve the wonders of primitive art for reverent posterity in the native ballads she would collect and sing to a delighted public, if only she learned how to sing. She studied Gustave Sondeleus. He was a silly person, not in the least like the gentlemanly insurance agents and office managers she was accustomed to meet at the country club, and what was worse, he did not ask her opinions on art and good form. His stories about generals and that sort of people could be discounted as lies, for did he not associate with grimy engineers? He needed some of her gentle but merry chiding. When they stood together at the rail, and he chanted in his ludicrous up-and-down Swedish sing-song that it was a fine evening, she remarked, "'Well, Mr. Ruffneck, have you been up to something smart again today? Or have you been giving somebody else a chance to talk for once?' She was placidly astonished when he clumped away with none of the obedient reverence which any example of cultured American womanhood has a right to expect from all males, even foreigners. Sondeleus came to Martin, lamenting, "'Slim, if I may call you so, like Terry, I think you and your Gottlieb are right. There is no use saving fools. It's a great mistake to be natural. One should always be a stuffed shirt, like old tubs.' then one would have respect, even from artistic New Jersey spinsters. How strange is conceit, that I, who have been cursed and beaten by so many great ones, who was once let out to be shot in a Turkish prison, should never have been annoyed by them as by this smug wench. Ah, smugness, that is the enemy. Apparently he recovered from Miss Gwilliam. He was seen arguing with the ship's doctor about sutures and negro skulls, and he invented a game of deck cricket. But one evening, when he sat reading in the social hall, stooped over, wearing betraying spectacles, and his mouth puckered, Martin walked past the window, and incredulously saw that Sondeleus was growing old. Part 8 As he sat by Leora in a deck chair, Martin studied her, really looking at her pale profile, after years when she had been a matter of course. He pondered on her, as he pondered on Fage. He weightily decided that he had neglected her, and weightily he started right in to be a good husband. Now I have a chance to be human, Lee. I realize how lonely you must have been in New York. But I haven't. Don't be foolish. Of course you've been lonely. Well... When we get back, I'll take a little time off every day, and we'll, we'll have walks and go to the movies and everything. And I'll send you flowers every morning. Isn't it a relief to just sit here? But I do begin to think and realize how I've probably neglected. Tell me, honey, has it been too terribly dull? Hunka, really? No, but tell me. There's nothing to tell. Now hang it, Leora. Here, when I do have the first chance in eleven thousand years to think about you, and I come right out frankly and admit how slack I've been, and planning to send you flowers. You look here, Sandy Arrowsmith. Quit bullying me. You want the luxury of harrowing yourself by thinking what a poor, bawling, wretched storybook wife I am. You're working up to become perfectly miserable if you can't enjoy being miserable. It would be terrible, when we got back to New York, if you did get on the job and devoted yourself to showing me a good time. You'd go at it like a bull. I'd have to be so dratted grateful for the flowers every day, the days you didn't forget, and the way you'd sling me off to the movies when I wanted to stay home and snooze. Well, by thunder, of all the... No, please, you're dear and good but you're so bossy that I've always got to be whatever you want, even if it's lonely. But maybe I'm lazy. I'd rather just snoop around than have to work at being well-dressed and popular and all those jobs. I fuss over the flat, hang it. Wish I'd had the kitchen repainted while we're away. It's a nice little kitchen. And I make believe read my French books and go out for a walk and look in the windows 
and eat an ice cream soda, and the day slides by. Sandy, I do love you awful much. If I could, I'd be as ill-treated as the Dickens, so you could enjoy it. But I'm no good at educated lies, only at easy little ones like the one I told you last week. I said I hadn't eaten any candy, and didn't have a stomach ache, and I'd eaten half a pound, and I was sick as a pup. Gosh, I'm a good wife, I am. They rolled from grey seas to purple and silver. By dusk they stood at the rail, and he felt the spaciousness of the sea, of life. Always he had lived in his imagination. As he had blundered through crowds, an inconspicuous young husband, trotting out to buy cold roast beef for dinner, his brain pan had been wide as the domed sky. He had not seen the streets, but microorganisms, large as jungle monsters, miles of flasks cloudy with bacteria, himself giving orders to his garçon, Max Gottlieb awesomely congratulating him. Always his dreams had clung about his work. Now, no less passionately, he awoke to the ship, the mysterious sea, the presence of Leora, and he cried to her in the warm tropic winter dusk. Sweet, this is only the first of our big hikes. Pretty soon, if I'm successful in St. Hubert, I'll begin to count in science, and we'll go abroad, to your France and England and Italy and everywhere. Can we, do you think? Oh, Sandy, going places! Part 9 He never knew it, but for an hour, in their cabin, half-lighted from the lamps in their sitting-room beyond, she watched him sleeping. He was not handsome. He was grotesque as a puppy, napping on a hot afternoon. His hair was ruffled, his face was deep in the crumpled pillow he had encircled with both his arms. She looked at him, smiling, with the stretched corners of her lips like tiny flung arrows. I do love him so when he's frowsy. Don't you see, Sandy? I was wise to come. You're so worn out. It might get you, and nobody but me could nurse you. Nobody knows all your cranky ways, about how you hate prunes and everything. Night and day I'll nurse you. The least whisper and I'll be awake. And if you need ice bags and stuff, and I'll have ice too, if I have to sneak into some millionaire's house and steal it out of his highballs, my dear. She lifted the electric fan so that it played more upon him, and on soft toes she crept into their stiff sitting-room. It did not contain much save a round table, a few chairs, and a sybaritic glass and mahogany wall cabinet whose purpose was never discovered. It's so sort of, ah, pinched. I guess maybe I ought to fix it up somehow but she had no talent for the composing of chairs and pictures which bring humanness into a dead room. Never in her life had she spent three minutes in arranging flowers. She looked doubtful, she smiled and turned out the light, and slipped in to him. She lay on the coverlet of her berth, in the tropic languidness, a slight figure in a frivolous nightgown. She thought, I like a small bedroom, because Sandy is nearer, and I don't get so scared by things. What a dratted bully the man is! Some day I'm going to up and say to him, You go to the devil, I will so. Darling, we will hike off to France together, just you and I, won't we? She was asleep, smiling, so thin a little figure. End of chapter 32「Chapter Thirty Three of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Misty mountains they saw, and on their flanks the palm-crowned fortifications built of old time against the pirates. In Martinique were white-faced houses like provincial France, and a boiling market full of colored women with kerchiefs ultramarine and scarlet. They passed hot St. Lucia and Saba, that is all one lone volcano. They devoured pawpaws and breadfruit and avocados, bought from coffee-colored natives who came alongside in nervous small boats, 
They felt the languor of the isles, and panted before they approached Barbados. Just beyond was St. Hubert. None of the tourists had known of the quarantine. They were raging that the company should have taken them into danger. In the tepid wind they felt the plague. The skipper reassured them in a formal address. Yes, they would stop at Blackwater, the port of St. Hubert, but they would anchor far out in the harbor, and while the passengers bound for St. Hubert would be permitted to go ashore in the port doctor's launch, no one in St. Hubert would be allowed to leave. Nothing from that pest hole would touch the steamer except the official mail, which the ship's surgeon would disinfect. The ship's surgeon was wondering the while how you disinfect mail. Let's see. Sulfur burning in the presence of moisture, wasn't it? The skipper had been trained in oratory by arguments with wharf masters, and the tourists were reassured. But Martin murmured to his commission, I hadn't thought of that. Once we go ashore, we'll be practically prisoners till the epidemic's over, if it ever does get over, prisoners with the plague around us. Why, of course, said Sondaleus. Part Two They left Bridgetown, the pleasant part of Barbados, by afternoon. It was late night, with most of the passengers asleep, when they arrived at Blackwater. As Martin came out on the damp and vacant deck, it seemed unreal, harshly unfriendly, and of the coming battleground he saw nothing but a few shore lights beyond uneasy water. About their arrival there was something timorous and illicit. The ship's surgeon ran up and down, looking disturbed. The captain could be heard growling on the bridge. The first officer hastened up to confer with him, and disappeared below again. And there was no one to meet them. The steamer waited, rolling in a swell, while from the shore seemed to belch a hot miasma. "'And here's where we're going to land and stay,' Martin grunted to Leora, as they stood by their bags their cases of fage on the heaving, black-shining deck near the top of the accommodation ladder. Passengers came out in dressing gowns, chattering, Yes, this must be the place, those lights there, must be fierce. What? Somebody going ashore? Oh, sure, those two doctors. Well, they got nerve. I certainly don't envy them. Martin heard. From shore a pitching light made toward the ship, slid round the bow, and sidled to the bottom of the accommodation ladder. In the haze of a lantern, held by a steward at the foot of the steps, Martin could see a smart-covered launch, manned by darky sailors in naval uniform and glazed black straw hats with ribbons, and commanded by a Scotch-looking man with some sort of a peaked uniform cap over a civilian jacket. The captain clumped down the swinging steps beside the ship. While the launch bobbed, its wet canvas top glistening, he had a long and complaining conference with the commander of the launch, and received a pouch of mail, the only thing to come aboard. The ship's surgeon took it from the captain with aversion, grumbling, Now where can I get a barrel to disinfect these darn letters in? Martin and Leora and Sondaleus waited without option. They had been joined by a thin woman in black whom they had not seen all the trip, one of the mysterious passengers who are never noticed till they come on deck at landing. Apparently she was going ashore. She was pale, her hands twitching. The captain shouted at them, All right, all right, all right. You can go now. Hustle, please. I've got to get on. Damn nuisance. The St. Burian had not seemed large or luxurious, but it was a castle, steadfast among storms, its side a massy wall, as Martin crept down the swaying stairs, thinking all at once, We're in for it, like going to the scaffold. They lead you along, no chance to resist. And, You're letting your imagination run away with you. Quit it now. And, Is it too late to make Lee stay behind on the steamer? And an agonized, Oh, Lord, are the stewards handling that fage carefully? Then he was on the tiny square platform at the bottom of the accommodation ladder. The ship's side was high above him, lit by the round ports of cabins, and someone was helping him into the launch. 
As the unknown woman in black came aboard, Martin saw in lantern light how her lips tightened once, then her whole face went blank, like one who waited hopelessly. Leora squeezed his hand hard, as he helped her in. He muttered, while the steamer whistled, Quick! You can still go back! You must! And leave the pretty launch? Why, Sandy, just look at the elegant engine it's got. Gosh, I'm scared blue! As the launch sputtered, swung round, and headed for the filtering of lights ashore, as it bowed its head and danced to the swell, the sandy-headed official demanded of Martin, "'You're the McGurk Commission?' "'Yes.' "'Good.' He sounded pleased, yet cold, a busy voice and humorless. "'Are you the port doctor?' asked Sandaleus. "'No, not exactly. I'm Dr. Stokes, of St. Swithin's Parish. We're all of us almost everything nowadays. The port doctor... In fact, he died a couple of days ago.' Martin grunted, but his imagination had ceased to agitate him. "'You're Dr. Sondaleus, I imagine. I know your work in Africa, in German East. Was out there myself. And you're Dr. Arrowsmith? I read your Plague Fage paper. Much impressed. Now I have just the chance to say, before we go ashore, you'll both be opposed. Inchcape Jones, the S.G., has lost his head, running in circles, lancing buboes, afraid to burn Carib, where most of the infection is. Arrowsmith, I have a notion of what you may want to do experimentally. If Inchcape balks, you come to me, in my parish, if I'm still alive. Stokes, my name is. Damn it, boy, what are you doing? Trying to drift clear down to Venezuela? Inchcape and H.E. are so afraid that they won't even cremate the bodies. Some religious prejudice among the blacks, O.B. or something. I see, said Martin. How many cases plague you got now, said Sondaleus. Lord knows, maybe a thousand, and ten million rats. I'm so sleepy. Well, welcome, gentlemen. He flung out his arms in a dry hysteria. Welcome to the island of Hesperides. Out of darkness, Blackwater swung toward them, low flimsy barracks on a low swampy plain, stinking of slimy mud. Most of the town was dark, dark and wickedly still. There was no face along the dim waterfront, warehouses, tram station, mean hotels, and they ground against a pier. They went ashore without attention from customs officials. There were no carriages, and the hotel runners, who once had pestered tourists landing from the St. Burian, whatever the hour, were dead now or hidden. The thin, mysterious woman passenger vanished. Staggering with her suitcase, she had said no word, and they never saw her again. The commission, with Stokes and the harbor police who manned the launch, carried the baggage, Martin weaving with a case of Lafarge, through the rutty, balconied streets to the San Marino Hotel. Once or twice, faces, disembodied things with frightened lips, stared at them from alley mouths, and when they came to the hotel, when they stood before it, a weary caravan, laden with bags and boxes, the bulging-eyed manageress peered from a window before she would admit them. As they entered, Martin saw under a street light the first stirring of life. A crying woman and a bewildered child followed an open wagon in which were heaped a dozen stiff bodies. And I might have saved all of them with Fage, he whispered to himself. His forehead was cold, yet it was greasy with sweat as he babbled to the manageress of rooms and meals, as he prayed that Leora might not have seen the things in that slow creaking wagon. I'd have choked her before I let her come if I'd known. He was shuddering. The woman apologized. I must ask you gentlemen to carry your things up to your rooms. Our boys, they aren't here any more. What became of the walking stick which, in such pleased vanity, Martin had bought in New York, he never knew. He was too busy guarding the cases of Fage and worrying. Maybe this stuff would save everybody. Now Stokes of St. Swithin's was a reticent man and hard, but when they had the last bag upstairs, 
He leaned his head against a door, cried, My God, Arrowsmith, I'm so glad you got here, and broke from them, running. One of the Negro Harbor police, expressionless, speaking the English of the Antilles, with something of the accent of Piccadilly, said, Sir, have you any other command for I? If you permit, we boys will now go home. Sir, on the table is the whiskey Dr. Stokes have told I to bring. Martin stared. It was Sandaleus who said, Thank you very much, boys. Here's a quid between you. Now get some sleep. They saluted. Sandaleus made the novices as merry as he could for half an hour. Martin and Leora woke to a broiling, flaring, green and crimson morning, yet ghastly still, awoke and realized that about them was a strange land, as yet unseen, and before them the work that in distant New York had seemed dramatic and joyful, and that stank now of the charnel house. Part Three a sort of breakfast was brought to them by a negress who, before she could enter, peeped fearfully at them from the door. Sondaleus rumbled in from his room, in an impassioned silk dressing gown. If ever, spectacled and stooped, he had looked old, now he was young and boisterous. Hey, a slim, I think we get some work here. Let me at those rats, this inch cape, to try to master them with strychnine. A noble melon. Leora, when you divorce Martin, you marry me, eh? Give me the salt. Yeah, I sleep fine. The night before, Martin had scarce looked at their room. Now he was diverted by what he considered its foreignness. The lofty walls of wood painted a watery blue, the wide furnitureless spaces, the bougainvillea at the window, and in the courtyard, the merciless heat and rattling metallic leaves of palmettos. Beyond the courtyard walls were the upper stories of a balconied Chinese shop and the violent-colored skylight of the Blue Bazaar. He felt that there should be a clamor from the exotic world, but there was only a rebuking stillness, and even Sondaleus became dumb, though he had his moment. He waddled back to his room, dressed himself in sura silk, last worn on the east coast of Africa, and returned bringing a sun helmet, which secretly he had bought for Martin. In the linen jacket and mushroom helmet, Martin belonged more to the tropics than to his own harsh northern meadows. But his pleasure in looking foreign was interrupted by the entrance of the Surgeon General, Dr. R. E. Inchcape Jones, lean but apple-cheeked, worried and hasty. Of course you chaps are welcome, but really, with all we have to do, I'm afraid we can't give you the attention you doubtless expect, he said indignantly. Martin sought for adequate answer. It was Sondaleus who spoke of a non-existent cousin who was a Harley Street specialist, and who explained that all they wanted was a laboratory for Martin and, for himself, a chance to slaughter rats. How many times, in how many lands, had Gustav Sondaleus flattered proconsuls and persuaded the heathen to let themselves be saved. Under his hands, the Surgeon General became practically human. He looked as though he really thought Leora was pretty. He promised that he might perhaps let Sondaleus tamper with his rats. He would return that afternoon and conduct them to the house prepared for them, Penrith Lodge, on the safe secluded hills behind Blackwater and, he bowed gallantly, he thought that Mrs. Arrowsmith would find the lodge a topping bungalow with three rather decent servants. The butler, though a colored chap, was an old mess sergeant. Inchcape Jones had scarce gone when at the door there was a pounding and it opened on Martin's classmate at Winnemac, Dr. the Reverend Ira Hinckley. Martin had forgotten Ira, that bulky Christian, who had tried to save him during otherwise dulcet hours of dissection. He recalled him confusedly. The man came in, vast and lumbering. His eyes were staring and altogether mad, and his voice was parched. Hello, Mart. Yump. It's old Ira. I'm in charge of all the chapels of the Sanctification Brotherhood here. 
Oh, Mart, if you only knew the wickedness of the natives, and the way they lie and sing indecent songs, and commit all manner of vileness, and the Church of England lets them wallow in their sins. Only us to save them. I heard you were coming. I have been laboring, Mart. I've nursed the poor plague-stricken devils, and I've told them how hellfire is roaring about them. Oh, Mart, if you knew how my heart bleeds to see these ignorant fellows going unrepentant to eternal torture. After all these years, I know you can't still be a scoffer. I come to you with open hands, begging you not merely to comfort the sufferers, but to snatch their souls from the burning lakes of sulphur to which, in his everlasting mercy, the Lord of hosts hath condemned those that blaspheme against his gospel, freely given. Again it was Sondaleus who got Ira Hinckley out, not too discontented, while Martin could only splutter. Now how do you suppose that maniac ever got here? This is going to be awful. Before Inchcape Jones returned, the commission ventured out for their first sight of the town. A scientific commission, yet all the while they were only boisterous Gustav and doubtful Martin and casual Leora. The citizens had been told that in bubonic plague, unlike pneumonic, there is no danger from direct contact with people developing the disease, so long as vermin were kept away. But they did not believe it. They were afraid of one another, and the more afraid of strangers. The commission found a street dying with fear. House shutters were closed, hot slatted patches in the sun and the only traffic was an empty trolley car with a frightened motorman who peered down at them and sped up lest they come aboard. Grocery shops and drug stores were open, but from their shady depths the shopkeepers looked out timidly, and when the commission neared a fish stall the one customer fled, edging past them. Once a woman, never explained, a woman with wild ungathered hair, ran by shrieking, My little boy! They came to the market, a hundred stalls under a long corrugated iron roof, with stone pillars bearing the fatuous names of the commissioners who had built it, by voting bonds for the building. It should have been buzzing with jovial buyers and sellers, but in all the gaudy booths there were only one negress with a row of twig besoms, one Hindu in grey rags squatting before his wealth of a dozen vegetables. The rest was emptiness, and a litter of rotted potatoes and scudding papers. Down a grim street of coal yards they found a public square, and here was the stillness, not of sleep, but of ancient death. The square was rimmed with the gloom of mango trees, which shut out the faint-hearted breeze and cooped in the heat, stale, lifeless heat, in whose misery the leering silence was the more dismaying. Through a break in the evil mangoes, they beheld a plaster house hung with black crepe. "'It's too hot to walk. Perhaps we'd better go back to the hotel,' said Leora. Part 4 In the afternoon, Inchcape Jones appeared with a Ford, whose familiarity made it the more grotesque in this creepy world, and took them to Penrith Lodge, on the cool hills behind Blackwater. They traversed a packed native section of bamboo hovels and shops that were unpainted, black-weathered huts without doors, without windows, from whose recesses dark faces looked at them resentfully. They passed, at their colored driver's most jerky speed, a new brick structure in front of which stately negro policemen with white gloves, white sun helmets, and scarlet coats cut by white belts marched with rifles at the carry. Inchcape Jones sighed, schoolhouse, turned it into pest house, hundred cases in there, die every hour, have to guard it, patients get delirious and try to escape. After them trailed an odor of rotting. Martin did not feel superior to humanity. Part 5 With broad porches and low roof, among bright flamboyants and the cheerful sago palms, the bungalow of Penrith Lodge lay high on a crest, looking across the ugly flat of the town to the wash of sea. At its windows the reed jalousies whispered and clattered, and the high bare rooms were enlivened by figured carib scarfs, 
It had belonged to the port doctor, dead these three days. Inchcape Jones assured the doubtful Leora that she would nowhere else be so safe. The house was rat-proofed, and the doctor had caught the plague at the pier, and died without ever coming back to this well-beloved bungalow in which he, the professional bachelor, had given the most clamorous parties in St. Hubert. Martin had with him sufficient equipment for a small laboratory, and he established it in a bedroom with gas and running water. Next to it was his and Leora's bedroom, then an apartment which Sondaleus immediately made homelike by dropping his clothes and his pipe ashes all over it. There were two colored maids and an ex-soldier butler, who received them and unpacked their bags as though the plague did not exist. Martin was perplexed by their first caller. He was a singularly handsome young negro, quick-moving, intelligent of eye. Like most white Americans, Martin had talked a great deal about the inferiority of negroes and had learned nothing whatever about them. He looked questioning as the young man observed, "'My name is Oliver Marchand.' "'Yes?' "'Dr. Marchand. I have my M.D. from Howard.' "'Oh!' "'May I venture to welcome you, doctor. And may I ask before I hurry off, I have three cases from official families isolated at the bottom of the hill. Oh, yes, in this crisis they permit a Negro doctor to practice even among the whites. But Dr. Stokes insists that de Harrell and you are right in calling bacteriophage an organism. But what about Bordet's contention that it's an enzyme? Then for half an hour did Dr. Arrowsmith and Dr. Marchand, forgetting the plague, forgetting the more cruel plague of race fear, draw diagrams. Marchand sighed, I must go, doctor. May I help you in any way I can? It is a great privilege to know you. He saluted quietly and was gone, a beautiful young animal. I never thought a negro doctor. I wish people wouldn't keep showing me how much I don't know, said Martin. Part 6 while Martin prepared his laboratory, Sondaleus was joyfully at work, finding out what was wrong with Inchcape Jones's administration, which proved to be almost anything that could be wrong. A plague epidemic today, in a civilized land, is no longer an affair of people dying in the streets and of drivers shouting, Bring out your dead! The fight against it is conducted like modern warfare with telephones instead of foaming chargers. The ancient horror bears a face of efficiency. There are offices, card indices, bacteriological examinations of patients and of rats. There is, or should be, a lone director with super-legal powers. There are large funds, education of the public by placard and newspaper, brigades of rat killers, a corps of disinfectors, isolation of patients, lest vermin carry the germs from them to others. In most of these particulars, Inchcape Jones had failed. To have the existence of the plague admitted in the first place, he had had to fight the merchants controlling the House of Assembly, who had howled that a quarantine would ruin them, and who now refused to give him complete power and tried to manage the epidemic with a board of health which was somewhat worse than navigating a ship during a typhoon by means of a committee. Inchcape Jones was courageous enough, but he could not cajole people. The newspapers called him a tyrant, would not help win over the public to take precautions against rats and ground squirrels. He had tried to fumigate a few warehouses with sulfur dioxide, but the owners complained that the fumes stained fabrics and paint and the Board of Health bade him wait, wait a little while, wait and see. He had tried to have the rats examined, to discover what were the centers of infection, but his only bacteriologists were the overworked Stokes and Oliver Marchand, and Inchcape Jones had often explained, at nice dinner parties, that he did not trust the intelligence of Negroes. He was nearly insane. He worked twenty hours a day, he assured himself that he was not afraid. He reminded himself that he had an honestly won DSO. He longed to have someone besides a board of red-leg merchants 
give him orders, and always in the blur of his sleepless brain he saw the hills of Surrey, his sisters in the Rose Walk, and the basket chairs and tea table beside his father's tennis lawn. Then Sondaleus, that crafty and often lying lobbyist, that unmoral soldier of the Lord, burst in and became dictator. He terrified the Board of Health. He quoted his own experiences in Mongolia and India. He assured them that if they did not cease being politicians, the plague might cling in St. Hubert forever, so that they would no more have the amiable dollars of the tourists and the pleasures of smuggling. He threatened and flattered, and told a story which they had never heard, even at the ice house, and he had Inchcape Jones appointed dictator of St. Hubert. Gustav Sondaleus stood extremely close behind the dictator. He immediately started rat-killing. On a warrant signed by Inchcape Jones, he arrested the owner of a warehouse who had declared that he was not going to have his piles of cocoa ruined. He marched his policemen, stout black fellows trained in the Great War, to the warehouse, set them on guard, and pumped in hydrocyanic acid gas. The crowd gathered beyond the police line, wondering, doubting. They could not believe that anything was happening, for the cracks in the warehouse walls had been adequately stuffed, and there was no scent of gas. But the roof was leaky, the gas crept up through it, colorless, diabolic, and suddenly a buzzard circling above the roof tilted forward, fell slantwise, and lay dead among the watchers. A man picked it up, goggling. Dead, right enough, everybody muttered. They looked at Sondaleus, parading among his soldiers, with reverence. His rat crew searched each warehouse before pumping in the gas, lest someone be left in the place, but in the third one a tramp had been asleep, and when the doors were anxiously opened after the fumigation, there were not only thousands of dead rats, but also a dead and very stiff tramp. Poor fella, bury him, said Sondaleus. There was no inquest. Over a rum swizzle at the ice house, Sondaleus reflected, I wonder how many men I murder, Martin. When I was disinfecting ships at Antofagasta, always afterward we find two or three stowaways. They hide too good, poor fellas. Sondaleus arbitrarily dragged bookkeepers and porters from their work to pursue the rats with poison, traps, and gas or to starve them by concreting and screening stables and warehouses. He made a red and green rat map of the town. He broke every law of property by raiding shops for supplies. He alternately bullied and caressed the leaders of the House of Assembly. He called on Kellett, told stories to his children, and almost wept as he explained what a good Lutheran he was. And consistently, but not at Kellett's, he drank too much. The ice house, that dimmest and most peaceful among saloons, with its cool marble tables, its gilt-touched white walls, had not been closed, though only the oldest topers and the youngest bravos, fresh out from home, and agonizingly lonely for Peckham or Walthamstow, for Peel Park or the Sirencester High Street, were desperate enough to go there, and of the attendants that remained, only one big Jamaican barman. By chance, he was among them all the most divine mixer of the planter's punch, the New Orleans fizz, and the rum swizzle. His masterpieces, Sondaleus acclaimed, he alone placid among the scary patrons who came in now not to dream, but to gulp and flee. After a day of slaughtering rats and disinfecting houses, he sat with Martin, with Martin and Leora, or with whomever he could persuade to linger. To Gustav Sondaleus, dukes and cobblers were alike remarkable, and Martin was sometimes jealous when he saw Sondaleus turning to a cocoa broker's clerk with the same smile he gave to Martin. For hours Sondaleus talked, of Shanghai and epistemology, and the painting of Nevinson. For hours he sang scurrilous lyrics of the quarter, and boomed, Yea, how I kill the rats at Kellett's wharf today! I don't think one little swizzle would break down too many glomeruli in an honest man's kidneys. 
He was cheerful, but never with the reproving and infuriating cheerfulness of an Ira Hinckley. He mocked himself, Martin, Leora, and their work. At home dinner he never cared what he ate, though he did care what he drank, which at Penrith Lodge was desirable, in view of Leora's efforts to combine the views of Wheatsylvania with the standards of West Indian servants, and the absence of daily deliveries. He shouted and sang, and took precautions for working among rats and the agile fleas, the high boots, the strapped wrists, and the rubber neckband, which he had invented, and which is known in every tropical supply shop today as the Sondaleus anti-vermin neck protector. It happened that he was, without Martin or Gottlieb ever understanding it, the most brilliant, as well as the least pompous, and therefore least appreciated warrior against epidemics that the world has known. Thus with Sondaleus, though for Martin there were as yet but embarrassment and futility, and the fear of fear. End of chapter 33「Chapter thirty four of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To persuade the shopkeeping lords of St. Hubert to endure a test in which half of them might die, so that all plague might, perhaps, be ended for ever, was impossible. Martin argued with Inchcape Jones, with Sondaleus, but he had no favour and he began to meditate a political campaign as he would have meditated an experiment. He had seen the suffering of the plague, and he had, though he still resisted, been tempted to forget experimentation, to give up the possible saving of millions for the immediate saving of thousands. Inchcape Jones, a little rested now under Sondaleus's padded bullying, and able to slip into a sane routine, drove Martin to the village of Carib, which, because of its pest of infected ground squirrels, was proportionately worse smitten than Blackwater. They sped out of the capital by white shell roads, agonizing to the sun-poisoned eyes. They left the dusty shanties of suburban Yamtown for a land cool with bamboo groves and palmettos thick with sugar cane. From a hilltop they swung down a curving road to a beach where the high surf boomed in limestone caves. It seemed impossible that this joyous shore could be threatened by plague, the slimy creature of dark alleys. The motor cut through a singing trade wind, which told of clean sails and disdainful men. They darted on where the foam feathers below Point Carib, and where, round that lone royal palm on the headland, the bright wind hums. They slipped into a hot valley, and came to the village of Carib, and to creeping horror. The plague had been dismaying in Blackwater. In Carib, it was the end of all things. The rat fleas had found fat homes in the ground squirrels, which burrowed in every garden about the village. In Blackwater, there had from the first been isolation of the sick. But in Carib, death was in every house, and the village was surrounded by soldier police with bayonets, who let no one come or go save the doctors. Martin was guided down the stinking street of cottages, palm-thatched and walled with cow-dung plaster on bamboo laths, cottages shared by the roosters and the goats. He heard men shrieking in delirium. A dozen times he saw that face of terror, sunken bloody eyes, drawn face, open mouth, which marks the black death. And once he beheld an exquisite girl-child in coma on the edge of death, her tongue black and round her the scent of the tomb. They fled away, to Point Carib and the trade wind, and when Inchcape Jones demanded, After that sort of thing, can you really talk of experimenting? Then Martin shook his head, while he tried to recall the vision of Gottlieb, and all their little plans. Half to get the fage, half to be sternly deprived. It came to him that Gottlieb, in his secluded innocence, had not realized what it meant to gain leave to experiment amid the hysteria of an epidemic. He went to the ice-house. He had a drink with a frightened clerk from Derbyshire. 
he regained the picture of Gottlieb's sunken, demanding eyes, and he swore that he would not yield to a compassion which in the end would make all compassion futile. Since Inchcape Jones could not understand the need of experimentation, he would call on the governor, Colonel Sir Robert Fairlamb. Part 2 Though Government House was officially the chief residence of St. Hubert, it was but a thatched bungalow, a little larger than Martin's own Penrith Lodge. When he saw it, Martin felt more easy, and he ambled up to the broad steps at nine of the evening, as though he were dropping in to call on a neighbor in Wheatsylvania. He was stopped by a Jamaican manservant of appalling courtesy. He snorted that he was Dr. Arrowsmith, head of the McGurk Commission, and he was sorry, but he must see Sir Robert at once. The servant was suggesting, in his blandest and most annoying manner, that really Dr. U uh would do better to see the Surgeon General, when a broad red face and a broad red voice projected themselves over the veranda railing, with a rumble of, Send him up, Jackson, and don't be a fool. Sir Robert and Lady Fairlamb were finishing dinner on the veranda, at a small round table littered with coffee and liqueurs, and starred with candles. She was a slight, nervous insignificance. He was rather puffy, very flushed, undoubtedly courageous, and altogether dismayed. And at a time when no laundress dared go anywhere, his evening shirt was luminous. Martin was in his now beloved linen suit, with a crumply soft shirt which Leora had been meanin' to wash. Martin explained what he wanted to do, what he must do, if the world was ever to get over the absurdity of having plague. Sir Robert listened so agreeably that Martin thought he understood, but at the end he bellowed, Young man, if I were commanding a division at the front, with a dud show, an awful show, going on, and a war office clerk asked me to risk the whole thing to try out some precious little invention of his own, can you imagine what I'd answer? There isn't much I can do now. These Dr. Johnnies have taken everything out of my hands. But as far as possible, I shall certainly prevent you Yankee vivisectionists from coming in and using us as a lot of sanguinary. Sorry, Evelyn, sanguinary corpses. Good night, sir. Part 3 Thanks to Sondaleus's crafty bullying, Martin was able to present his plan to a special board, composed of the governor, the temporarily suspended board of health, Inchcape Jones, several hearty members of the House of Assembly, and Sondaleus himself, attending in the unofficial capacity which all over the world he had found useful for masking a cheerful tyranny. Sondaleus even brought in the negro doctor, Oliver Marchand, not on the ground that he was the most intelligent person on the island, which happened to be Sondaleus's reason, but because he represented the plantation hands. Sondaleus himself was as much opposed to Martin's unemotional experiments as was Fairlamb. He believed that all experiments should be, by devices not entirely clear to him, carried on in the laboratory without disturbing the conduct of agreeable epidemics, but he could never resist a drama like the innocent meeting of the special board. The meeting was set for a week ahead, with scores dying every day. While he waited for it, Martin manufactured morphage and helped Sondaleus murder rats, and Leora listened to the midnight debates of the two men, and tried to make them acknowledge that it had been wise to let her come. Inchcape Jones offered to Martin the position of government bacteriologist, but he refused, lest he be sidetracked. The special board met in Parliament House all of them trying to look, not like their simple and domestic selves, but like judges. With them appeared such doctors of the island as could find the time. While Leora listened from the back of the room, Martin addressed them, not unaware of the spectacle of little Mart Arrowsmith of Elk Mills, taken seriously by the rulers of a tropic isle headed by a Sir Somebody. Beside him stood Max Gottlieb, and in Gottlieb's power, he reverently sought to explain that mankind had ever given up eventual greatness because some crisis, some war or election or loyalty to a messiah, which at the moment seemed weighty, had choked the patient search for truth. 
He sought to explain that he could, perhaps, save half of a given district, but to test for all time the value of Fage, the other half must be left without it, though, he craftily told them, in any case the luckless half would receive as much care as at present. Most of the board had heard that he possessed a magic cure for the plague, which, for unknown and probably discreditable reasons, he was withholding, and they were not going to have it withheld. There was a great deal of discussion rather unconnected with what he had said, and out of it came only the fact that everybody except Stokes and Oliver Marchand was against him. Kellett was angry with this American, Sir Robert Fairlam was beefily disapproving, and Sondaleus admitted that though Martin was quite a decent young man, he was a fanatic. Into their argument plunged a fury in the person of Ira Hinckley, missionary of the Sanctification Brotherhood. Martin had not seen him since the first morning in Blackwater. He gaped as he heard Ira pleading, "'Gentlemen, I know, almost the whole bunch of you are Church of England, but I beg you to listen to me, not as a minister, but as a qualified doctor of medicine. Oh, the wrath of God is upon you, but I mean... I was a classmate of Arrowsmith in the States. I'm on to him. He was such a failure that he was suspended from medical school. A scientist. And his boss, this fellow Gottlieb, he was fired from the University of Winnemac for incompetence. I know him. Liars and fools. Scorners of righteousness. Has anybody but Arrowsmith himself told you he's a qualified scientist? The face of Sondaleus changed from curiosity to stolid Scandinavian wrath. He arose and shouted, Sir Robert, this man is crazy. Dr. Gottlieb is one of the seven distinguished living scientists, and Dr. Arrowsmith is his representative. I announce my agreement with him complete. As you must have seen from my work, I'm perfectly independent of him and entirely at your service but I know his standing, and I follow him quite humbly. The special board coaxed Ira Hinckley out, for the meanest of reasons. In St. Hubert, the whites do not greatly esteem the holy ecstasies of Negroes in the Sanctification Brotherhood chapels, but they voted only to give the matter their consideration, while still men died by the score each day. And in Manchuria, as in St. Hubert, they prayed for rest from the ancient clawing pain. Outside, as the special board trudged away, Sondaleus blared at Martin and the indignant Leora. Yea, a fine fight! Martin answered, Gustav, you've joined me now. The first darn thing you do, you come have a shot of Fage. No, Slim, I said I will not have your Fage till you give it to everybody. I mean it, no matter how much I make fools of your board. As they stood before Parliament House, a small motor possessing everything but comfort and power staggered up to them, and from it vaulted a man lean as Gottlieb and English as Inchcape Jones. "'You, Dr. Arrowsmith? My name is Twyford, Cecil Twyford, of St. Swithin's Parish. Tried to get here for the special board meeting, but my beastly foreman had to take the afternoon off and die of plague. Stokes has told me your plans.' Quite right. All nonsense to go on having plague. Board refused. Sorry. Perhaps we can do something in St. Swithin's. Good day. All evening, Martin and Sondaleus were full of language. Martin went to bed, longing for the regularity of working all night and foraging for cigarettes at dawn. He could not sleep, because an imaginary Ira Hinckley was always bursting in on him. Four days later, he heard that Ira was dead. Till he had sunk in coma, Ira had nursed and blessed his people, the humble colored congregation in the hot tin chapel which he had now turned into a pest house. He staggered from cot to cot under the gospel texts he had lettered on the whitewashed wall. Then he cried once, loudly, and dropped by the pine pulpit where he had joyed to preach. Part 4 one chance Martin did have. In Carib, where every third man was down with plague, and one doctor to attend them all, he now gave Fage to the entire village, a long strain of injections, not improved by the knowledge that one jaunty flea from any patient might bring him the plague. 
The tedium of dread was forgotten when he began to find and make precise notes of a slackening of the epidemic, which was occurring nowhere except here at Carib. He came home raving to Leora. I'll show em. Now they'll let me try test conditions, and then when the epidemic's over, we'll hustle home. It'll be lovely to be cold again. Wonder if Holabird and Schultes are any more friendly now. Be pretty good to see the old flat, eh? Yes, won't it? said Leora. I wish I'd thought to have the kitchen painted while we're away. I think I'll put that blue chair in the bedroom. There was a decrease in the plague at Carib. Sandaleus was worried, because it was the worst centre for infected ground squirrels on the island. He made decisions quickly. One evening he explained certain things to Inchcape Jones and Martin, wrote down their doubts, and snorted, "'Only way to disinfect that place is to burn it. Burn the whole thing. Have it done before morning, before anybody can stop us.' With Martin as his lieutenant, he marshalled his troop of rat-catchers, ruffians, all of them, with high boots, tied jacket-sleeves, and ebon visages of piracy. They stole food from shops, tents and blankets and camp-stoves from the government military warehouse, and jammed their booty into motor-trucks. The line of trucks roared down to Carib, the rat-catchers sitting atop, singing pious hymns. They charged on the village, drove out the healthy, carried the sick on litters, settled them all in tents in a pasture up the valley, and after midnight they burned the town. The troops ran among the huts, setting them alight with fantastic torches. The palm thatch sent up thick smoke, dead sluggish white, with currents of ghastly black through which broke sudden flames. Against the glare the palmettos were silhouetted. The solid-seeming huts were instantly changed into thin bamboo frameworks, thin lines of black slats, with the thatch falling in sparks. The flame lighted the whole valley, roused the terrified squawking birds, and turned the surf at Point Carib to bloody foam. With such of the natives as had strength enough and sense enough, Sondaleus's troops made a ring about the burning village, shouting insanely as they clubbed the fleeing rats and ground squirrels. In the flare of devastation, Sondaleus was a fiend, smashing the bewildered rats with a club, shooting at them as they fled, and singing to himself all the while the obscene chanty of Bill the Sailor. But at dawn he was nursing the sick in the bright new canvas village, showing mammies how to use their camp stoves, and in a benevolent way discussing methods of poisoning ground squirrels in their burrows. Sondaleus returned to Blackwater, but Martin remained in the tent village for two days, giving them the fage, making notes, directing the amateur nurses. He returned to Blackwater one mid-afternoon and sought the office of the Surgeon General, or what had been the office of the Surgeon General, till Sondaleus had come and taken it away from him. Sondaleus was there, at Inchcape Jones's desk, but for once he was not busy. He was sunk in his chair, his eyes bloodshot. We had a fine time with the rats at Carib, eh? How is my new tent village? He chuckled, but his voice was weak, and as he rose he staggered. What is it? What is it? I tink it's got me. Some flea got me. Yes, in a shaky but extremely interested manner, I was used thinking I will go and quarantine myself. I have fever all right, and adenitis. My strength, huh, I am almost sixty, but the way I can lift weights that no sailor can touch, and I could fight five rounds. Oh, my God, Martin, I am so weak, not scared, no. But for Martin's arms, he would have collapsed. He refused to return to Penrith Lodge and Leora's nursing. I, who have isolated so many, it is my turn he said. Martin and Inchcape Jones found for Sondaleus a meagre clean cottage. The family had died there, all of them, but it had been fumigated. They procured a nurse, and Martin himself attended the sick man, trying to remember that once he had been a doctor, who understood ice bags and consolation. One thing was not to be had, mosquito netting, and only of this did Sondaleus complain. Martin bent over him, agonized to see how burning was his skin, how swollen his face and his tongue, 
how weak his voice, as he babbled, Gottlieb is right about these jests of God. Yea, his best one is the tropics. God planned them so beautiful, flowers and sea and mountains. He made the fruit to grow so well that man not need work, and then he laughed, and stuck in volcanoes and snakes and damp heat and early senility and the plague and malaria. But the nastiest trick he ever played on man was inventing the flea. His bloated lips widened, from his hot throat oozed a feeble croaking, and Martin realized that he was trying to laugh. He became delirious, but between spasms he muttered, with infinite pain, tears in his eyes at his own weakness, I want you to see how an agnostic can die. I am not afraid, but used once more, I would like to see Stockholm and Fifth Avenue on the day the first snow falls, and Holy Week at Sevilla, and one good last drunk. I am very peaceful, Slim. It hurt some, but life was a good game, and I am a pious agnostic. Oh, Martin, give my people the fage. Save all of them. God, I did not think they could hurt me so. His heart had failed. He was still on his low cot. Part 5 Martin had an unhappy pride that, with all his love for Gustav Sondeleus, he would still keep his head, still resist Inchcape Jones's demand that he give the fage to everyone, still do what he had been sent to do. I'm not a sentimentalist, I'm a scientist, he boasted. They snarled at him in the streets now. Small boys called him names and threw stones. They had heard that he was willfully withholding their salvation. The citizens came in committees to beg him to heal their children, and he was so shaken that he had ever to keep before him the vision of Gottlieb. The panic was increasing. They who had at first kept cool could not endure the strain of wakening at night to see upon their windows the glow of the pile of logs on Admiral Knob, the emergency crematory where Gustav Sondeleus and his curly gray mop had been shoveled into the fire, along with a crippled negro boy and a Hindu beggar. Sir Robert Fairlam was a blundering hero, exasperating the sick while he tried to nurse them. Stokes remained the rock of ages. He had only three hours sleep a night, but he never failed to take his accustomed fifteen minutes of exercise when he awoke, and Leora was easy in Penrith Lodge, helping Martin prepare Fage. It was the Surgeon General who went to pieces. Robbed of his dependence on the despised Sondeleus, sunk again in a mad planlessness, Inchcape Jones shrieked when he thought he was speaking low, and the cigarette, which was ever in his thin hand, shook so that the smoke quivered up in trembling spirals. Making his tour, he came at night on a sloop by which a dozen red legs were escaping to Barbados and suddenly he was among them, bribing them to take him along. As the sloop stood out from Blackwater Harbor, he stretched his arms toward his sisters and the peace of the Surrey Hills, but as the few frightened lights of the town were lost, he realized that he was a coward and came up out of his madness, with his lean head high. He demanded that they turn the sloop and take him back. They refused, howling at him, and locked him in the cabin. They were becalmed. It was two days before they reached Barbados, and by then the world would know that he had deserted. Altogether expressionless, Inchcape Jones tramped from the sloop to a waterfront hotel in Barbados, and stood for a long time in a slatternly room smelling of slop pails. He would never see his sisters and the cool hills. With the revolver which he had carried to drive terrified patients back into the isolation wards, with the revolver which he had carried at Arras, he killed himself. Part 6 Thus Martin came to his experiment. Stokes was appointed Surgeon General, Vice Inchcape Jones, and he made an illegal assignment of Martin to St. Swithin's Parish, as medical officer with complete power. This, and the concurrence of Cecil Twyford, made his experiment possible. He was invited to stay at Twyford's. His only trouble was the guarding of Leora. 
He did not know what he would encounter in St. Swithin's, while Penrith Lodge was as safe as any place on the island. When Leora insisted that, during his experiment, the cold thing which had stilled the laughter of Sondaleus might come to him, and he might need her. He tried to satisfy her by promising that if there was a place for her in St. Swithin's, he would send for her. Naturally, he was lying. Hard enough to see Gustav go. By thunder, she's not going to run risks, he vowed. He left her, protected by the maids and the soldier butler, with Dr. Oliver Marchand, to look in when he could. Part 7 In St. Swithin's Parish, the cocoa and bamboo groves and sharp hills of southern St. Hubert gave way to unbroken cane fields. Here Cecil Twyford, that lean, abrupt man, ruled every acre and interpreted every law. His place, Frangipani Court, was a refuge from the hot humming plain. The house was old and low, of thick stone and plaster walls. The panelled rooms were lined with the china, the portraits, and the swords of Twyford's for three hundred years, and between the wings was a walled garden dazzling with hibiscus. Twyford led Martin through the low, cool hall, and introduced him to five great sons and to his mother, who, since his wife's death ten years ago, had been mistress of the house. "'Have tea?' said Twyford. "'Our American guest will be down in a moment.' He would not have thought of saying it, but he had sworn that since for generations Twyford's had drunk tea here at a seemly hour, no panic should prevent their going on drinking it at that hour. When Martin came into the garden, when he saw the old silver on the wicker table, and heard the quiet voices, the plague seemed conquered, and he realized that four thousand miles southwest of the Lizard he was in England. They were seated, pleasant but not too comfortable, when the American guest came down, and from the door stared at Martin as strangely as he stared in turn. He beheld a woman who must be his sister. She was perhaps thirty to his thirty-seven, but in her slenderness, her paleness, her black brows and dusky hair, she was his twin. She was his self-enchanted. He could hear his voice croaking, "'But you're my sister!' And she opened her lips, yet neither of them spoke as they bowed at introduction. When she sat down, Martin had never been so conscious of a woman's presence. He learned before evening that she was Joyce Lanyon, widow of Roger Lanyon of New York. She had come to St. Hubert to see her plantations, and had been trapped by the quarantine. He had tentatively heard of her dead husband, as a young man of wealth and family. He seemed to remember having seen in Vanity Fair a picture of the Lanyons at Palm Beach. She talked only of the weather, the flowers, but there was a rising gaiety in her which stirred even the dour Cecil Twyford. In the midst of her debonair insults to the hugest of the huge sons, Martin turned on her. "'You are my sister!' "'Obviously. Well, since you're a scientist, are you a good scientist?' "'Pretty good.' "'I've met your Mrs. McGurk, and Dr. Rippleton Holabird. Met him in Hessian Hook. You know it, don't you?' "'No, I... Oh, I've heard of it. You know, that renovated old part of Brooklyn, where writers and economists, and all those people, some of them almost as good as the very best, consort with people who are almost as smart as the very smartest. You know, where they dress for dinner, but all of them have heard about James Joyce. Dr. Hollibird is frightfully charming, don't you think? Why... Tell me, I really mean it. Cecil has been explaining what you plan to do experimentally. Could I help you, nursing or cooking or something, or would I merely be in the way? I don't know yet. If I can use you, I'll be unscrupulous enough. Oh, don't be earnest like Cecil here, and Dr. Stokes. They have no sense of play. Do you like that man, Stokes? Cecil adores him, and I suppose he's simply infested with virtues but I find him so dry and thin and unappetizing. Don't you think he might be a little gayer? Martin gave up all chance of knowing her as he hurled. Look here, you said you found Hollibird charming. It makes me tired to have you fall for his scientific tripe and not appreciate Stokes. Stokes is hard, thank God, and probably he's rude. 
Why not? He's fighting a world that bellows for fake charm. No scientist can go through his grind and not come out more or less rude. And I tell you, Stokes was born a researcher. I wish we had him at McGurk. Rude. Wish you could hear him being rude to me. Twyford looked doubtful. His mother looked delicately shocked. And the five sons beefily looked nothing at all. While Martin raged on, trying to convey his vision of the barbarian, the ascetic, the contemptuous acolyte of science. But Joyce Lanyon's lovely eyes were kind, and when she spoke she had lost something of her too cosmopolitan manner of a diner out. Yes, I suppose it's the difference between me playing at being a planter and Cecil. After dinner he walked with her in the garden, and sought to defend himself against he was not quite sure what, till she hinted, my dear man, you're so apologetic about never being apologetic. If you really must be my twin brother, do me the honor of telling me to go to the devil whenever you want to. I don't mind. Now about your Gottlieb, who seems to be so much of an obsession with you. Obsession? Rats. He... They parted an hour after. Least of all things, Martin desired such another peeping, puerile, irritable restlessness as he had shared with Orchid Pickerbaugh. But as he went to bed in a room with old prints and a four-poster, it was disturbing to know that somewhere near him was Joyce Lanyon. He sat up, aghast with truth. Was he going to fall in love with this desirable and quite useless young woman? How lovely her shoulders, above black satin at dinner! She had a genius of radiant flesh. It made that of most women, even the fragile Leora, seem coarse and thick. There was a rosy glow behind it, as from an inner light. Did he really want Leora here, with Joyce Lanyon in the house? Dear Leora, who was the source of life, was she now off there in Penrith Lodge, missing him, lying awake for him? How could he, even in the crisis of an epidemic, invite the formal Twyfords to invite Leora? How honest was he, that afternoon he had recognized the rigid, though kindly code of the Twyfords. But could he not set it aside by being frankly an outlander? Suddenly he was out of bed, kneeling, praying to Leora. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The plague had only begun to invade St. Swithin's, but it was unquestionably coming, and Martin, with his power as official medical officer of the parish, was able to make plans. He divided the population into two equal parts. One of them, driven in by Twyford, was injected with plague fage, and the other half was left without. He began to succeed. He saw far-off India, with its annual 400,000 deaths from plague, saved by his efforts. He heard Max Gottlieb saying, Martin, you have done your experiment. I am very glad. The pest attacked the unfaged half of the parish much more heavily than those who had been treated. There did appear a case or two among those who had the fage, but among the others there were ten, then twenty, then thirty daily victims. These unfortunate cases he treated, giving the fage to alternate patients, in the somewhat barren almshouse of the parish, a whitewashed cabin, the meaner against its vaulting background of banyans and breadfruit trees. He could never understand Cecil Twyford, Though Twyford had considered his hands as slaves, though he had, in his great barony, given them only this barren almshouse, yet he risked his life now in nursing them, and the lives of all his sons. Despite Martin's discouragement, Mrs. Lanyon came down to cook, and a remarkably good cook she was. She also made beds. She showed more intelligence than the Twyford men about disinfecting herself and as she bustled about the rusty kitchen, in a gingham gown she had borrowed from a maid, she so disturbed Martin that he forgot to be gruff. Part 2 
In the evening, while they returned by Twyford's rattling little motor to Frangipani Court, Mrs. Lanyon talked to Martin as one who had shared his work, but when she had bathed and powdered and dressed, he talked to her as one who was afraid of her. Their bond was their resemblance as brother and sister. They decided, almost irritably, that they looked utterly alike, except that her hair was more patent leather than his, and she lacked his impertinent, cocking eyebrow. Often Martin returned to his patients at night, but once or twice Mrs. Lanyon and he fled, as much from the family stolidity of the Twyfords, as from the thought of fevered scorched patients, to the shore of a rocky lagoon which cut far in from the sea. They sat on a cliff, full of the sound of the healing tide. His brain was hectic with the memory of charts on the whitewashed, broad planks of the almshouse, the sun cracks in the wall, the puffy, terrified faces of black patients, how one of the Twyford sons had knocked over an ampule of Fage, and how itchingly hot it had been in the ward. But to his intensity, the lagoon breeze was cooling, and cooling the rustling tide. He perceived that Mrs. Lanyon's white frock was fluttering about her knees. He realized that she, too, was strained and still. He turned somberly toward her, and she cried, "'I'm so frightened and so lonely. The Twyfords are heroic, but they're stone. I'm so marooned.' He kissed her, and she rested against his shoulder. The softness of her sleeve was agitating to his hand but she broke away with, No, you don't really care a hang about me. Just curious. Perhaps that's a good thing for me tonight. He tried to assure her, to assure himself, that he did care with peculiar violence, but languor was over him. Between him and her fragrance were the hospital cots, a great weariness, and the still face of Leora. They were silent together, and when his hand crept to hers, they sat unimpassioned, comprehending, free to talk of what they would. He stood outside her door, when they had returned to the house, and imagined her soft moving within. No, he raged, can't do it. Joyce, women like her, one of the million things I've given up for work and for Lee. Well, that's all there is to it, then. But if I were here two weeks, fool, she'd be furious if you knocked but he was aware of the dagger of light under her door the more aware of it as he turned his back and tramped to his room part three the telephone service in st hubert was the clumsiest feature of the island there was no telephone at penrith lodge the port doctor had cheerfully been wont to get his calls through a neighbor the central was now demoralized by the plague and when for two hours Martin had tried to have Leora summoned, he gave up. But he had triumphed. In three or four days he would drive to Penrith Lodge. Twyford had blankly assented to his suggestion that Leora be invited hither, and if she and Joyce Lanyon should become such friends that Joyce would never again turn to him in loneliness, he was willing, he was eager, he was almost eager. Part Four. When Martin left her at the lodge, in the leafy gloom high on the Penrith Hills, Leora felt his absence. They had been so little apart since he had first come on her, scrubbing a hospital room in Zenith. The afternoon was unending. Each time she heard a creaking, she roused with the hope that it was his step, and realized that he would not be coming all the blank evening, the terrifying night would not be here anywhere, not his voice, nor the touch of his hand. Dinner was mournful. Often enough she had dined alone when Martin was at the Institute, but then he had been returning to her some time before dawn, probably, and she had reflectively munched a snack on the corner of the kitchen table, looking at the funnies in the evening paper. Tonight she had to live up to the butler, who served her as though she were a dinner party of twenty. She sat on the porch, staring at the shadowy roofs of black water below, sure that she felt a miasm writhing up through the hot darkness. She knew the direction of St. Swithin's parish. 
beyond that delicate glimmer of lights from palm huts coiling up the hills. She concentrated on it, wondering if by some magic she might not have a signal from him, but she could get no feeling of his looking toward her. She sat long and quiet. She had nothing to do. Her night was sleepless. She tried to read in bed, by an electric globe, inside the misty little tent of the mosquito netting, but there was a tear in the netting, and the mosquitoes crept through. As she turned out the light and lay tense, unable to give herself over to sleep, unable to sink into security, while to her blurred eyes the half-seen folds of the mosquito netting seemed to slide about her, she tried to remember whether these mosquitoes might be carrying plague germs. She realized how much she had depended on Martin for such bits of knowledge, as for all philosophy. She recalled how annoyed he had been, because she could not remember whether the yellow fever mosquito was Anopheles or Stegomaya, or was it Aedes? And suddenly she laughed in the night. She was reminded that he had told her to give herself another injection of Fage. Hang it, I forgot. Well, I must be sure to do that tomorrow. Do that tomorrow, do that tomorrow, buzzed in her brain, an irritating, inescapable refrain, while she was suspended over sleep, conscious of how much she wanted to creep into his arms. Next morning, and she did not remember to give herself another injection, the servants seemed twitchy, and her efforts to comfort them brought out the news that Oliver Marchand, the doctor on whom they depended, was dead. In the afternoon, the butler heard that his sister had been taken off to the isolation ward, and he went down to Blackwater to make arrangements for his nieces. He did not return. No one ever learned what had become of him. Toward dusk, when Leora felt as though a skirmish line were closing in on her, she fled into Martin's laboratory. It seemed filled with his jerky, brimming presence. She kept away from the flasks of plague germs, but she picked up, because it was his, a half-smoked cigarette, and lighted it. There was a slight crack in her lips, and that morning, fumbling at dusting, here in the laboratory, meant as a fortress against disease, a maid had knocked over a test tube, which had trickled. The cigarette seemed dry enough, but in it there were enough plague germs to kill a regiment. Two nights after, when she was so desperately lonely that she thought of walking to Blackwater, finding a motor, and fleeing to Martin, she woke with a fever, a headache, her limbs chilly. When the maids discovered her in the morning, they fled from the house. While lassitude flowed round her, she was left alone in the isolated house, with no telephone. All day, all night, as her throat crackled with thirst, she lay longing for someone to help her. Once she crawled to the kitchen for water. The floor of the bedroom was an endless heaving sea, the hall a writhing dimness, and by the kitchen door she dropped and lay for an hour, whimpering. Got to got to can't remember what it was her voice kept appealing to her cloudy brain aching fighting the ache she struggled up wrapped about her a shabby cloak which one of the maids had abandoned in flight and in the darkness staggered out to find help as she came to the highway she stumbled and lay under the hedge unmoving like a hurt animal on hands and knees she crawled back into the lodge, and between times, as her brain went dark, she nearly forgot the pain in her longing for Martin. She was bewildered. She was lonely. She dared not start on her long journey without his hand to comfort her. She listened for him, listened, tense with listening. You will come. I know you'll come and help me. I know you'll come. Martin. Sandy, Sandy, she sobbed. Then she slipped down into the kindly coma. There was no more pain, and all the shadowy house was quiet but for her hoarse and struggling breath. Part 5 Like Sondaleus, Joyce Lanyon tried to persuade Martin to give the fage to everybody. 
I'm getting to be good and stern, with all you people after me. Regular Gottlieb. Nothing can make me do it, not if they try to lynch me, he boasted. He had explained Leora to Joyce. I don't know whether you two will like each other. You're so darn different. You're awfully articulate, and you like these pretty people that you're always talking about. But she doesn't care a hang for em. She sits back. Oh, she never misses anything. But she never says much. Still, she's got the best instinct for honesty that I've ever known. I hope you two'll get each other. I was afraid to let her come here. Didn't know what I'd find. But now I'm going to hustle to Penrith and bring her here today. He borrowed Twyford's car and drove to Blackwater, up to Penrith, in excellent spirits. For all the plague, they could have a lively time in the evenings. One of the Twyford sons was not so solemn. He and Joyce, with Martin and Leora, could slip down to the lagoon for picnic suppers. They would sing. He came up to Penrith Lodge, bawling, Lee! Leora! Come on! Here we are! The veranda, as he ran up on it, was leaf-scattered and dusty, and the front door was banging. His voice echoed in a desperate silence. He was uneasy. He darted in, found no one in the living room, the kitchen, then hastened into their bedroom. On the bed, across the folds of the torn mosquito netting, was Leora's body, very frail, quite still. He cried to her. He shook her. He stood weeping. He talked to her, his voice a little insane, trying to make her understand that he had loved her and had left her here only for her safety. There was rum in the kitchen, and he went out to gulp down raw, full glasses. They did not affect him. By evening he strode to the garden, the high and windy garden looking toward the sea, and dug a deep pit. He lifted her light, stiff body, kissed it, and laid it in the pit. All night he wandered. When he came back to the house and saw the row of her little dresses with the lines of her soft body in them, he was terrified. Then he went to pieces. He gave up Penrith Lodge, left Twyford's, and moved into a room behind the Surgeon General's office. Beside his cot there was always a bottle. Because death had, for the first time, been brought to him, he raged, Oh, damn experimentation! And despite Stokes's dismay, he gave the fage to everyone who asked. Only in St. Swithin's, since there his experiment was so excellently begun, did some remnant of honor keep him from distributing the fage universally. But the conduct of this experiment he turned over to Stokes. Stokes saw that he was a little mad, but only once, when Martin snarled, What do I care for your science? did he try to hold Martin to his test. Stokes himself, with Twyford, carried on the experiment and kept the notes Martin should have kept. By evening, after working fourteen or fifteen hours since dawn, Stokes would hasten to St. Swithin's by motorcycle. He hated the joggling and the lack of dignity, and he found it somewhat dangerous to take curving hill roads at sixty miles an hour. But this was the quickest way, and till midnight he conferred with Twyford, gave him orders for the next day, arranged his clumsy annotations, and marveled at his grim meekness. Meantime, all day, Martin injected a line of frightened citizens in the Surgeon General's office in Blackwater. Stokes begged him, at least, to turn the work over to another doctor, and take what interest he could in St. Swithin's. But Martin had a bitter satisfaction in throwing away all his significance, in helping to wreck his own purposes. With the nurse for assistant, he stood in the bare office. File on file of people, black, white, Hindu, stood in an agitated queue a block long, ten deep, waiting dumbly as for death. They crept up to the nurse beside Martin, and in embarrassment exposed their arms, which she scrubbed with soap and water and dabbled with alcohol, before passing them on to him. He brusquely pinched up the skin of the upper arm and jabbed it with the needle of the syringe, cursing at them for jerking, never seeing their individual faces. 
As they left him, they fluttered with gratitude. Oh, may God bless you, doctor. But he did not hear. Sometimes Stokes was there, looking anxious, particularly when in the queue he saw plantation hands from St. Swithin's, who were supposed to remain in their parish under strict control, to test the value of the fage. Sometimes Sir Robert Fairlamb came down to beam and gurgle and offer his aid. Lady Fairlamb had been injected first of all, and next to her a tattered kitchen wench, profuse with hallelujahs. After a fortnight when he was tired of the drama, he had four doctors making the injections, while he manufactured fage. But by night Martin sat alone, tousled, drinking steadily, living on whiskey and hate, freeing his soul, and dissolving his body by hatred, as once hermits dissolved theirs by ecstasy. His life was as unreal as the nights of an old drunkard. He had an advantage over normal cautious humanity, in not caring whether he lived or died, he who sat with the dead, talking to Leora and Sondaleus, to Ira Hinckley and Oliver Marchand, to Inchcape Jones, and a shadowy horde of black men with lifted, appealing hands. After Leora's death, he had returned to Twyford's but once, to fetch his baggage, and he had not seen Joyce Lanyon. He hated her. He swore that it was not her presence which had kept him from returning earlier to Leora, but he was aware that while he had been chattering with Joyce, Leora had been dying. Damn glib society climber! Thank God I'll never see her again! He sat on the edge of his cot, in the constricted and airless room, his hair ruffled, his eyes blotched with red, a stray alley kitten, which he esteemed his only friend, asleep on his pillow. At a knock he muttered, I can't talk to Stokes now. Let him do his own experiments. Sick of experiments. Sulkily. Oh, come in. The door opened on Joyce Lanyon. Cool, trim, sure. What do you want? he grunted. She stared at him. She shut the door. Silently, she straightened the litter of food, papers, and instruments on his table. She coaxed the indignant kitten to a mat, patted the pillow, and sat by him on the frowsy cot. Then, "'Please, I know what happened. Cecil is in town for an hour, and I wanted to bring—' "'Won't it comfort you a little, if you know how fond we are of you? Won't you let me offer you friendship?' "'I don't want anybody's friendship.' I haven't any friends. He sat dumb, her hand on his, but when she was gone, he felt a shiver of new courage. He could not get himself to give up his reliance on whiskey, and he could see no way of discontinuing the Fage injection of all who came begging for it, but he turned both injection and manufacture over to others, and went back to the most rigid observation of his experiment in St. Swithin's, blotted as it now was, by the unfaged portion of the parish going into Blackwater to receive the fage. He did not see Joyce. He lived at the almshouse, but most evenings now he was sober. Part 6 The gospel of rat extermination had spread through the island. Everybody, from five-year-old to hobbling grandam, was out shooting rats and ground squirrels. Whether from fage or rat-killing or providence, the epidemic paused, and six months after Martin's coming, when the West Indian May was broiling, and the season of hurricanes was threatened, the plague had almost vanished, and the quarantine was lifted. St. Hubert felt safe in its kitchens and shops, and amid the roaring spring, the island rejoiced, as a sick man, first delivered from pain, rejoices at merely living and being at peace. That chaffering should be abusive and loud in the public market, that lovers should stroll unconscious of all save themselves, that loafers should tell stories and drink long drinks at the ice house, that old men should squat cackling in the shade of the mangoes, that congregations should sing together to the Lord, this was no longer ordinary to them nor stupid, but the bliss of paradise. They made a festival of the first steamers leaving white and black, Hindu and chink and Caribbee, 
They crowded the wharf, shouting, waving scarfs, trying not to weep at the feeble piping of what was left of the Blackwater gold medal band. And as the steamer, the St. Aya of the McGurk line, was warped out, with her captain at the rail of the bridge, very straight, saluting them with a flourish, but his eyes so wet that he could not see the harbor, they felt that they were no longer jailed lepers, but a part of the free world. On that steamer, Joyce Lanyon sailed. Martin said good-bye to her at the wharf. Strong of hand, almost as tall as he, she looked at him without flutter, and rejoiced. You've come through, so have I. Both of us have been mad, trapped here the way we've been. I don't suppose I helped you, but I did try. You see, I'd never been trained in reality. You trained me. Good-bye. Mayn't I come to see you in New York? If you'd really like to. She was gone, yet she had never been so much with him as through that tedious hour when the steamer was lost beyond the horizon, a line edged with silver wire. But that night, in panic, he fled up to Penrith Lodge and buried his cheek in the damp soil above the Leora, with whom he had never had to fence and explain, to whom he had never needed to say, Mayn't I come to see you? But Leora, cold in her last bed, unsmiling, did not answer him nor comfort him. Part 7 Before Martin took leave, he had to assemble the notes of his Fodge experiment, add the observation of Stokes and Twyford to his own first precise figures. As the giver of Fodge to some thousands of frightened islanders, he had become a dignitary. He was called, in the first issue of the Blackwater Guardian, after the quarantine was raised, the savior of all our lives. He was the universal hero. If Sondaleus had helped to cleanse them, had Sondaleus not been his lieutenant? If it was the intervention of the Lord, as the earnest old negro, who succeeded Ira Hinckley in the chapels of the Sanctification Brotherhood, insisted, had not the Lord surely sent him? No one heeded a wry Scotch doctor, diligent but undramatic through the epidemic, who hinted that plagues have been known to slacken and cease without Fage. When Martin was completing his notes, he had a letter from the McGurk Institute, signed by Rippleton Holabird. Holabird wrote that Gottlieb was feeling seedy, that he had resigned the directorship, suspended his own experimentation, and was now at home resting. Holabird himself had been appointed acting director of the Institute, and as such he chanted, the reports of your work in the letters from Mr. McGurk's agents, which the quarantine authorities have permitted to get through to us, apprise us far more than does your own modest report, what a really sensational success you have had. You have done what few other men living could do, both established the value of bacteriophage in plague by tests on a large scale, and saved most of the unfortunate population. The Board of Trustees and I are properly appreciative of the glory which you have added, and still more will add when your report is published to the name of McGurk Institute. And we are thinking, now that we may for some months be unable to have your titular chief, Dr. Gottlieb, working with us, of establishing a separate department with you as its head. Establish the value, rats. I about half made the tests sighed Martin, and, Department, I've given too many orders here. Sick of authority. I want to get back to my lab and start all over again. It came to him that now he would probably have ten thousand a year. Leora would have enjoyed small extravagant dinners. Though he had watched Gottlieb declining, it was a shock that he could be so unwell as to drop his work even for a few months. He forgot himself, as it came to him, that in giving up his experiment, playing the savior, he had been a traitor to Gottlieb and all that Gottlieb represented. When he returned to New York, he would have to call on the old man and admit to him, to those sunken, relentless eyes, that he did not have complete proof of the value of the Fage. If he could have run to Leora with his ten thousand a year. Part 8 he left St. Hubert three weeks after Joyce Lanyon. 
the evening before his sailing a great dinner with sir robert fairlam in the chair was given to him and to stokes while sir robert ruddily blurted compliments and kellett tried to explain things and all of them drank to him standing after the toast to the king martin sat lonely considering that tomorrow he would leave these trusting eyes and face the harsh demands of Gottlieb, of Terry Wicket. The more they shouted his glory, the more he thought about what unknown, tight-minded scientists in distant laboratories would say of a man who had had his chance and cast it away. The more they called him the giver of life, the more he felt himself disgraced and a traitor. And as he looked at Stokes, he saw in his regard a pity worse than condemnation. End of chapter 35。chapter 36 of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。it happened that Martin returned to New York as he had come on the Saint Burian。the ship was haunted with the phantoms of Leora dreaming、of Sondaleus shouting on the bridge。and on the St. Burian was the country club Miss Gilliam, who had offended Sondaleus. She had spent the winter, importantly making notes on native music in Trinidad and Caracas, at least in planning to make notes. She saw Martin come aboard at Blackwater, and pertly noted the friends who saw him off, two Englishmen, one puffy, one rangy, and a dry-looking Scotsman. "'Your friends all seem to be British,' she enlightened him, when she had claimed him as an old friend. Yes. You've spent the winter here. Yes. Hard luck to be caught by the quarantine, but I told you you were silly to go ashore. You must have managed to pick up quite a little money practicing, but it must have been unpleasant, really. Yes, I suppose it was. I told you it would be. You ought to have come on to Trinidad, such a fascinating island. And tell me, how is the roughneck? Who? Oh, you know, that funny Swede that used to dance and everything. He is dead. Oh, I am sorry. You know, no matter what the others said, I never thought he was so bad. I'm sure he had quite a nice cultured mind when he wasn't carousing around. Your wife isn't with you, is she? No, she isn't with me. I must go down and unpack now. Miss Gwilliam looked after him with an expression which said that the least people could do was to learn some manners. Part Two With the heat and the threat of hurricanes, there were few first-class passengers on the St. Burian, and most of these did not count because they were not jolly, decent Yankee tourists, but merely South Americans as tourists do when their minds have been broadened and enriched by travel, when they return to New Jersey or Wisconsin with the credit of having spent a whole six months in the West Indies and South America, the respectable remnant studied one another fastidiously, and noted the slim pale man who seemed so restless, who all day trudged round the deck, who after midnight was seen standing by himself at the rail. "'That guy looks awful restless to me,' said Mr. S. Sanborn Hibble, of Detroit, to the charming Mrs. Dawson of Memphis. And she answered, with the wit which made her so popular wherever she went, "'Yes, don't he? I reckon he must be in love.' "'Oh, I know him,' said Miss Gwilliam. "'He and his wife were on the St. Burian when I came down. She's in New York now.' He's some kind of a doctor, not awful successful, I don't believe. Just between ourselves, I don't think much of him or of her either. They sat and looked stupid all the way down. Part 3 Martin was itching to get his fingers on his test tubes. He knew, as once he had guessed, that he hated administration and large affairs. As he tramped the deck, his head cleared and he was himself. Angrily, he pictured the critics who would soon be pecking at whatever final report he might make. For a time he hated the criticism of his fellow laboratory grinds, as he had hated their competition. 
he hated the need of forever looking over his shoulder at pursuers. But on a night when he stood at the rail for hours, he admitted that he was afraid of their criticism, and afraid because his experiment had so many loopholes. He hurled overboard all the polemics with which he had protected himself. Men who never have had the experience of trying, in the midst of an epidemic, to remain calm and keep experimental conditions, do not realize in the security of their laboratories what one has to contend with. Constant criticism was good, if only it was not spiteful, jealous, petty. No, even then it might be good. Some men had to be what easy-going workers called spiteful. To them, the joyous spite of crushing the almost good was more natural than creation. Why should a great house-wrecker, who could clear the cumbered ground, be set at trying to lay brick? All right, he rejoiced, let em come. Maybe I'll anticipate em and publish a roast of my own work. I have got something from the St. Swithin test, even if I did let things slide for a while. I'll take my tables to a biometrician. He may rip em up. Good. What's left I'll publish. He went to bed, feeling that he could face the eyes of Gottlieb and Terry, and for the first time in weeks he slept without terror. Part 4 at the pier in Brooklyn, to the astonishment and slight indignation of Miss Gwilliam, Mr. S. Sanborn Hibble, and Mrs. Dawson, Martin was greeted by reporters who agreeably, though vaguely, desired to know what were these remarkable things he had been doing to some disease or other, in some island or place. He was rescued from them by Rippleton Holabird, who burst through them with his hands out, crying, Oh, my dear fellow, we know all that's happened, we grieve for you so, and we're so glad you were spared to come back to us. Whatever Martin might, under the shadow of Max Gottlieb, have said about Holabird, now he wrung his hands and muttered, It's good to be home. Holabird, he was wearing a blue shirt with a starched blue collar, like an actor, could not wait till Martin's baggage had gone through the customs he had to return to his duties as acting director of the institute. He delayed only to hint that the board of trustees were going to make him full director, and that certainly, my dear fellow, he would see that Martin had the credit and the reward he deserved. When Hollibird was gone, driving away in his neat coupe, he often explained that his wife and he could afford a chauffeur, but they preferred to spend the money on other things. Martin was conscious of Terry Wicket, leaning against a gnawed wooden pillar of the wharf-house, as though he had been there for hours. Terry strolled up and snorted, "'Hello, Slim. All okay? Let's shoot the stuff through the customs. Great pleasure to see the director and you kissing.' As they drove through the summer-walled streets of Brooklyn, Martin inquired, "'How's Holabird working out as director? And how is Gottlieb?' Oh, the Holy Wren is no worse than Tubbs. He's even politer and more ignorant. Me? You watch me. One of these days I'm going off to the woods. Got a shack in Vermont. Going to work there, without having to produce results for the director. They've stuck me in the Department of Biochemistry. And Gottlieb... Terry's voice became anxious. I guess he's pretty shaky. They've pensioned him off. Now look, Slim... I hear you're going to be a gilded department head, and I'll never be anything but an associate member. Are you going on with me, or are you going to be one of the Holy Wren's pets, hero scientist? I'm with you, Terry, you old grouch. Martin dropped the cynicism, which had always seemed proper between him and Terry. I haven't got anybody else. Leora and Gustav are gone, and now maybe Gottlieb. You and I have got to stick together. It's a go. They shook hands, they coughed gruffly, and talked of straw hats. Part 5 When Martin entered the Institute, his colleagues galloped up to shake hands and to exclaim, and if their praise was flustering, there is no time at which one can stomach so much of it as at homecoming. Sir Robert Fairlam had written to the Institute a letter glorifying him. 
The letter arrived on the same boat with Martin, and next day Hollibird gave it out to the press. The reporters, who had been only a little interested at his landing, came around for interviews, and while Martin was sulky and jerky, Hollibird took them in hand, so that the papers were able to announce that America, which was always rescuing the world from something or other, had gone and done it again. It was spread in the prints that Dr. Martin Arrowsmith was not only a powerful witch-doctor, and possibly something of a laboratory hand, but also a ferocious rat-killer, village-burner, special board addresser, and snatcher from death. There was at the time, in certain places, a doubt as to how benevolent the United States had been to its little brothers, Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and the editors and politicians were grateful to Martin for this proof of their sacrifice and tender watchfulness. He had letters from the Public Health Service, from an enterprising Midwestern college, which desired to make him a doctor of civil law, from medical schools and societies which begged him to address them. Editorials on his work appeared in the medical journals and the newspapers, and Congressman Almas Pickerbaugh telegraphed him from Washington, in what the congressman may conceivably have regarded as verse, they not to go some to get ahead of fellows that come from old Nautilus. And he was again invited to dinner at the McGurk's, not by Capitola, but by Ross McGurk, whose name had never had such a whitewashing. He refused all invitations to speak and the urgent organizations which had invited him responded with meekness that they understood how intimidatingly busy Dr. Arrowsmith was, and if he ever could find the time they would be most highly honored. Rippleton Hollibird was elected full director now, in succession to Gottlieb, and he sought to use Martin as the prize exhibit of the Institute. He brought all the visiting dignitaries, all the foreign men of measured merriment, in to see him, and they looked pleased and tried to think up questions. Then Martin was made head of the new Department of Microbiology at twice his old salary. He never did learn what was the difference between microbiology and bacteriology, but none of his glorification could he resist. He was still too dazed. He was the more dazed when he had seen Max Gottlieb. Part 6 the morning after his return, he had telephoned to Gottlieb's flat, had spoken to Miriam, and received permission to call in the late afternoon. All the way uptown, he could hear Gottlieb saying, You were my son, I gave you everything, I knew of truth and honor, and you have betrayed me. Get out of my sight. Miriam met him in the hall, fretting. I don't know if I should have let you come at all, doctor. Why? Isn't he well enough to see people? It isn't that. He doesn't really seem ill, except that he's feeble. But he doesn't know anyone. The doctors say it's senile dementia. His memory is gone, and he's just suddenly forgotten all his English. He can only speak German, and I can't speak it hardly at all. If I'd only studied it instead of music. But perhaps it may do him good to have you here. He was always so fond of you. You don't know how he talked of you, and the splendid experiment you've been doing in St. Hubert. Well, I... He could find nothing to say. Miriam led him into a room whose walls were dark with books. Gottlieb was sunk in a worn chair, his thin hand lax on the arm. Doctor, it's Arrowsmith. Just got back, Martin mumbled. The old man looked as though he half understood. He peered at him, then shook his head and whimpered, Verste nicht. His arrogant eyes were clouded with ungovernable slow tears. Martin understood that never could he be punished now and cleansed. Gottlieb had sunk into his darkness, still trusting him. Part 7 Martin closed his flat, their flat, with a cold swift fury, lest he yield to his misery in finding among Leora's possessions a thousand fragments which brought her back, the frock she had bought for Capitola McGurk's dinner, a petrified chocolate she had hidden away to munch illegally by night, 
a memorandum, get almonds for Sandy. He took a grimly impersonal room in a hotel, and sunk himself in work. There was nothing for him but work and the harsh friendship of Terry Wickett. His first task was to check the statistics of his St. Swithin treatments, and the new figures still coming in from Stokes. Some of them were shaky, some suggested that the value of Fage certainly had been confirmed, but there was nothing final. He took his figures to Raymond Pearl, the biometrician, who thought less of them than did Martin himself. He had already made a report of his work to the director and the trustees of the Institute, with no conclusion except, the results await statistical analysis and should have this before they are published. But Hollabird had run wild, the newspapers had reported wonders, and in on Martin poured demands that he send out Fage, inquiries as to whether he did not have a Fage for tuberculosis, for syphilis, offers that he take charge of this epidemic and that. Pearl had pointed out that his agreeable results in first Faging the whole of Carib village must be questioned, because it was possible that when he began, the curve of the disease had already passed its peak. With this, and the other complications, viewing his hot work in St. Hubert as coldly as though it were the pretense of a man whom he had never seen, Martin decided that he had no adequate proof, and strode in to see the director. Hollibird was gentle and pretty, but he sighed that if this conclusion were published, he would have to take back all the things he had said about the magnificence which, presumably, he had inspired his subordinate to accomplish. He was gentle and pretty, but firm. Martin was to suppress, Holliber did not say suppress, he said, leave to me for further consideration the real statistical results, and issue the report with an ambiguous summary. Martin was furious, Holliber delicately relentless. Martin hastened to Terry, declaring that he would resign, would denounce, would expose. Yes, he would. He no longer had to support Leora. He'd work as a drug clerk. He'd go back right now and tell the holy Wren. Hey, Slim, wait a minute. Hold your horses, observed Terry. Just get along with Holly for a while, and we'll work out something we can do together and be independent. Meanwhile, you've got your lab here and you still have some physical chemistry to learn. And, uh, Slim, I haven't said anything about your St. Hubert stuff, but you know and I know you bunged it up badly. Can you come into court with clean hands if you're going to indict the Holy One? Though I do agree that aside from being a dirty, lying, social-climbing, sneaking, power-grabbing hypocrite, he's all right. Hold on. We'll fix up something. Why, son... We've just been learning our science. We're just beginning to work. Then Hollibird published officially, under the Institute's seal, Martin's original report to the trustees, with such quaint revisions as a change of the results should have analysis to while statistical analysis would seem desirable, it is evident that this new treatment has accomplished all that had been hoped. Again Martin went mad. Again, Terry calmed him, and with a hard fury, unlike his eagerness of the days when he had known that Leora was waiting for him, he resumed his physical chemistry. He learned the involved mysteries of freezing point determinations, osmotic pressure determinations, and tried to apply Northrop's generalizations on enzymes to the study of Fage. He became absorbed in mathematical laws which strangely predicted natural phenomena. His world was cold, exact, austerely materialistic, bitter to those who founded their logic on impressions. He was daily more scornful toward the counters of paving stones, the renamers of species, the compilers of irrelevant data. In his absorption, the pleasant seasons passed unseen. Once he raised his head in astonishment to perceive that it was spring, once Terry and he tramped two hundred miles through the Pennsylvania hills by summer roads. But it seemed only a day later, when it was Christmas, and Hollibird was being ever so jolly and yuley about the Institute. The absence of Gottlieb may have been good for Martin, 
since he no longer turned to the master for solutions in tough queries. When he took up diffusion problems, he began to develop his own apparatus, and whether it was from inborn ingenuity or merely from a fury of labor, he was so competent that he won from Terry the almost overwhelming praise, Why, that's not so darn bad, Slim! The sureness, to which Max Gottlieb seems to have been born, came to Martin slowly, after many stumblings, but it came. He desired a perfection of technique in the quest for absolute and provable fact. He desired as greatly as any painter to burn with a hard gem-like flame, and he desired not to have ease and repute in the marketplace, but rather to keep free of those follies, lest they confuse him and make him soft. Hollabird was as much bewildered as Tubbs would have been by the ramifications of Martin's work. What did he think he was, anyway, a bacteriologist or a biophysicist? But Hollabird was won by the scientific world's reception of Martin's first important paper on the effect of X-rays, gamma rays, and beta rays on the anti phage. It was praised in Paris and Brussels and Cambridge as much as in New York, for its insight and for the clarity and to perhaps be unscientifically enthusiastic, the sheer delight and style of its presentation, as Professor Berkeley Wirtz put it, which may be indicated by quoting the first paragraph of the paper. In a preliminary publication, I have reported a marked qualitative destructive effect of the radiations from radium emanations on bacteriophage anti -shiga. In the present paper, it is shown that X-rays, gamma rays, and beta rays produce identical inactivating effects on this bacteriophage. Furthermore, a quantitative relation is demonstrated to exist between this inactivation and the radiations that produce it. The results obtained from this quantitative study permit the statement that the percentage of inactivation, as measured by determining the units of bacteriophage remaining after irradiation by gamma and beta rays of a suspension of fixed virulence, is a function of the two variables, millicuries and hours. The following equation accounts quantitatively for the experimental results obtained. K equals lambda log E times U naught over U divided by E naught times epsilon minus lambda T1. When director Hollibird saw the paper, Yeo was vicious enough to take it in and ask his opinion. He said, Splendid! Oh, I say, simply splendid! I've just had the chance to skim through it, old boy, but I shall certainly read it carefully the first free moment I have. End of chapter 36Chapter 37 of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Martin did not see Joyce Lanyon for weeks after his return to New York. Once she invited him to dinner, but he could not come, and he did not hear from her again. His absorption in osmotic pressure determinations did not content him when he sat in his prim hotel room and was reduced from Dr. Arrowsmith to a man who had no one to talk to. He remembered how they had sat by the lagoon in the tepid twilight. He telephoned, asking whether he might come in for tea. He knew in an unformulated way that Joyce was rich, but after seeing her in gingham, cooking in the kitchen of St. Swithin's almshouse, he did not grasp her position. He was uncomfortable when, feeling dusty from the laboratory, he came to her great house and found her the soft-voiced mistress of many servants. Hers was a palace, and palaces, whether they are such very little ones as Joyce's, with its eighteen rooms, or Buckingham, or vast Fontainebleau, are all alike. They are choked with the superfluities of pride. They are so complete that one does not remember small endearing charms. They are indistinguishable in their common feeling of polite and uneasy grandeur. They are therefore altogether tedious. But amid the pretentious splendor which Roger Lanyon had accumulated, Joyce was not tedious. 
it is to be suspected that she enjoyed showing Martin what she really was, by producing footmen and too many kinds of sandwiches, and by boasting, Oh, I never do know what they are going to give me for tea. But she had welcomed him, crying, You look so much better, I'm frightfully glad. Are you still my brother? I was a good cook at the almshouse, wasn't I? Had he been suave then and witty, she would not have been greatly interested. She knew too many men who were witty and well-bred, ivory smooth and competent, to help her spend the four or five million dollars with which she was burdened. But Martin was at once a scholar who made osmotic pressure determinations almost interesting, a taut swift man whom she could fancy running or making love, and a lonely youngster who naively believed that here in her soft security she was still the girl who had sat with him by the lagoon, still the courageous woman who had come to him in a drunken room at Blackwater. Joyce Lanyon knew how to make men talk. Thanks more to her than to his own articulateness, he made living the Institute, the members their feuds, and the drama of coursing on the trail of a discovery. Her easy life here had seemed tasteless after the risks of St. Hubert, and in his contempt for ease and rewards she found exhilaration. He came now and then to tea, to dinner. He learned the ways of her house, her servants, the more nearly intelligent of her friends. He liked, and possibly he was liked by, some of them. With one friend of hers, Martin had a state of undeclared war. This was Latham Ireland, an achingly well-dressed man of fifty, a competent lawyer, who was fond of standing in front of fireplaces and being quietly clever. He fascinated Joyce by telling her that she was subtle, then telling her what she was being subtle about. Martin hated him. In midsummer, Martin was invited for a weekend at Joyce's vast blossom-hid country house at Greenwich. She was half apologetic for its luxury. He was altogether unhappy. The strain of considering clothes, of galloping out to buy white trousers when he wanted to watch the test tubes in the constant temperature bath, of trying to look easy in the limousine which met him at the station, and of deciding which servants to tip and how much and when, was dismaying to a simple man. He felt rustic when, after he had blurted, just a minute till I go up and unpack my suitcase, she said gently. Oh, that will have been done for you. He discovered that a valet had laid out for him to put on, that first evening, all the small store of underclothes he had bought, and had squeezed out on his brush a ribbon of toothpaste. He sat on the edge of his bed, groaning, This is too rich for my blood. He hated and feared that valet, who kept stealing his clothes, putting them in places where they could not be found, then popping in menacingly when Martin was sneaking about the enormous room looking for them. But his chief unhappiness was that there was nothing to do. He had no sport but tennis, at which he was too rusty to play with these chattering unidentified people who filled the house, and, apparently with perfect willingness, worked at golf and bridge. He had met but few of the friends of whom they talked. They said, You know dear old R.G.? And he said, Oh, yes. But he never did know dear old R.G. Joyce was as busily amiable as when they were alone at tea. And she found for him a weedy flapper whose tennis was worse than his own. But she had twenty guests, forty at Sunday lunch, and he gave up certain agreeable notions of walking with her in fresh lanes and, after excitedly saying this and that, perhaps kissing her. He had one moment with her. As he was going, she ordered, Come here, Martin, and led him apart. You haven't really enjoyed it. Why, sure, of course, I... Of course you haven't, and you despise us, rather, and perhaps you're partly right. I do like pretty people and gracious manners and good games, but I suppose they seem piffling after nights in a laboratory. No, I like them too, in a way. I like to look at beautiful women, and you. But, oh, darn it, Joyce, I'm not up to it. 
I've always been poor and horribly busy. I haven't learned your games. But, Martin, you could, with the intensity you put into everything. Even getting drunk in Blackwater. And I hope in New York, too. Dear Roger, he did have such an innocent, satisfying time getting drunk at class dinners. But I mean, if you went at it, you could play bridge and golf and talking better than any of them. If you only knew how frightfully recent most of the ducal class in America are. And, Martin, wouldn't it be good for you? Wouldn't you work all the better if you got away from your logarithmic tables now and then? And are you going to admit there's anything you can't conquer? No, I... Will you come to dinner on Tuesday week, just us two, and we'll fight it out? Be glad to. For a number of hours, on the train to Terry Wickett's vacation place, in the Vermont Hills, Martin was convinced that he loved Joyce Lanyon, and that he was going to attack the art of being amusing as he had attacked physical chemistry. Ardently, and quite humorlessly, as he sat stiffly in a stale Pullman chair car, with his feet up on his suitcase, he pictured himself wearing a club tie, presumably first acquiring the tie and the club playing golf in plus fours, and being entertaining about dear old R.G., and incredibly witty about dear old Latham Ireland's aged Rolls Royce. But these ambitions he forgot, as he came to Terry's proud proprietary shanty, by a lake among oaks and maples, and heard Terry's real theories of the decomposition of quinine derivatives. Being perhaps the least sentimental of human beings, Terry had named his place Bertie's Rest. He owned five acres of woodland, two miles from a railroad station. His shanty was a two-room affair of logs, with bunks for beds and oilcloth for table linen. "'Here's the layout, Slim,' said Terry. "'Some day I'm going to figure out a way of making a lab here pay, by manufacturing Syra or something, and I'll put up a couple more buildings on the flat by the lake.' and have one absolutely independent place for science. Two hours a day on the commercial end, and say about six for sleeping, and a couple for feeding and telling dirty stories. That leaves two and six and two make ten, if I'm any authority on higher math. That leaves fourteen hours a day for research, except when you've got something special on with no director, and no society patrons, and no trustees that you've got to satisfy by making full reports. Of course there won't be any scientific dinners with ladies in candy-box dresses, but I figure we'll be able to afford plenty of salt pork and corn-cob pipes, and your bed will be made perfectly, if you make it yourself. Huh? Let's go and have a swim. Martin returned to New York, with the not very compatible plans of being the best-dressed golfer in Greenwich and of cooking beef stew with Terry at Bertie's Rest. But the first of these was the more novel to him. Part Two Joyce Lanyon was enjoying a conversion. Her St. Hubert experiences and her natural variability had caused her to be dissatisfied with Roger's fast motoring set. She let the Lady Messinuses of her acquaintance beguile her into several of their causes, and she enjoyed them as she had enjoyed her active and entirely purposeless war work in 1917, for Joyce Lanyon was to some degree an arranger, which was an epithet invented by Terry Wickett for Capitola McGurk. An arranger, and even an improver, was Joyce, but she was not a Capitola. She neither waved a feathered fan, and spoke spaciously, nor did she take out her sex passion in talking. She was fine and occasionally gorgeous, with tiger in her, though she was as far from perfumed boudoir and black lingerie passion as she was from Capitola's cooing staleness. Hers was sheer straight white silk and cherished skin. Behind all her reasons for valuing Martin was the fact that the only time in her life when she had felt useful and independent, was when she had been an almshouse cook. She might have drifted on, in her world of drifters, but for the interposition of Latham Ireland, the lawyer dilettante lover. Joy, he observed, 
there seems to be an astounding quantity of that Dr. Arrowsmith person about the place. As your benign uncle... Latham, my sweet, I quite agree that Martin is too aggressive, thoroughly unlicked, very selfish, rather a prig, absolutely a pedant, and his shirts are atrocious, and I rather think that I shall marry him. I almost think I love him. Wouldn't cyanide be a neater way of doing suicide? said Latham, Ireland. Part 3 what Martin felt for Joyce was what any widowed man of thirty-eight would feel for a young and pretty and well-spoken woman who was attentive to his wisdom. As to her wealth, there was no problem at all. He was no poor man marrying money. Why, he was making ten thousand a year, which was eight thousand more than he needed to live on. Occasionally, he was suspicious of her dependence on luxury. With tremendous craft, he demanded that instead of their dining in her Jacobean hall of state, she come with him on his own sort of party. She came with enthusiasm. They went to abysmal Greenwich Village restaurants with candles, artistic waiters, and no food, or to Chinatown dives with food and nothing else. He even insisted on their taking the subway, though after dinner he usually forgot that he was being Spartan, and ordered a taxicab. She accepted it all without either wincing or too much gurgling. She played tennis with him in the court on her roof. She taught him bridge, which, with his concentration and his memory, he soon played better than she and enjoyed astonishingly. She persuaded him that he had a leg and would look well in golf clothes. He came to take her to dinner on a serene autumn evening. He had a taxi waiting. Why don't we stick to the subway? she said. They were standing on her doorstep, in a blankly expensive and quite unromantic street off Fifth Avenue. Oh, I hate the rotten subway as much as you do. Elbows in my stomach never did help me much to plan experiments. I expect when we're married I'll enjoy your limousine. Is this a proposal? I'm not at all sure I'm going to marry you. Really, I'm not. You have no sense of ease. They were married the following January, in St. George's Church, and Martin suffered almost as much over the flowers, the bishop, the relatives with high-pitched voices, and the top hat which Joyce had commanded, as he had, over having Rippleton Hollibird, wring his hand with a look of, At last, dear boy, you have come out of barbarism and become one of us. Martin had asked Terry to be his best man. Terry had refused, and asserted that only with pain would he come to the wedding at all. The best man was Dr. William Smith, with his beard trimmed for the occasion, and distressing morning clothes, and a topper which he had bought in London eleven years before, but both of them were safe in charge of a cousin of Joyce, who was guaranteed to have extra handkerchiefs and to recognize the wedding march. He had understood that Martin was Groton and Harvard, and when he discovered that he was Winnemac and nothing at all, he became suspicious. In their stateroom on the steamer, Joyce murmured, Dear, you were brave. I didn't know what a damn fool that cousin of mine was. Kiss me. Thenceforth, except for a dreadful second, when Leora floated between them, eyes closed and hands crossed on her pale cold breast, they were happy, and in each other found adventurous new ways. Part 4 For three months they wandered in Europe. On the first day Joyce had said, Let's have this beastly money thing over. I should think you are the least mercenary of men. I've put ten thousand dollars to your credit in London. Oh, yes, and fifty thousand in New York. And if you'd like, when you have to do things for me, I'd be glad if you'd draw on it. No, wait. Can't you see how easy and decent I want to make it all? You won't hurt me to save your own self-respect? Part 5 They really had, it seemed, to stay with the Principessa del Oltraggio, formerly Miss Lucy Demi Bessie of Dayton, Madame des Bosses Loges, Miss Brown of San Francisco, and the Countess of Marazion, who had been Mrs. Arthur Snape of Albany, and several things before that. 
but Joyce did go with him to see the great laboratories in London, Paris, Copenhagen. She swelled to perceive how Nobel Prize winners received her husband, knew of him, desired to be violent with him about Fage, and showed him their work of years. Some of them were hasty and graceless, she thought. Her man was prettier than any of them, and if she would be but patient with him, she could make him master polo and clothes and conversation, but of course go on with his science. A pity he could not have a knighthood, like one or two of the British scientists they met. But even in America there were honorary degrees. While she discovered and digested science, Martin discovered women. Part 6 Aware only of Madeline Fox and Orchid Pickerbaugh, who were nice American girls, of soon-forgotten ladies of the night, and of Leora, who, in her indolence, her indifference to decoration and good fame, was neither woman nor wife, but only her own self, Martin knew nothing whatever about women. He had expected Leora to wait for him, to obey his wishes, to understand without his saying them all the flattering things he had planned to say. He was spoiled, and Joyce was not timorous about telling him so. It was not for her to sit beaming and wordless while he and his fellow researchers arranged the world. With many jolts, he perceived that even outside the bedroom he had to consider the fluctuations and variables of his wife as a woman, and sometimes as a rich woman. It was confusing to find that where Leora had acidly claimed sex loyalty, but had hummingly not cared in what manner he might say good morning, Joyce was indifferent as to how many women he might have fondled, as long as he did not insult her by making love to them in her presence, but did require him to say good morning as though he meant it. It was confusing to find how starkly she discriminated between his caresses when he was absorbed in her, and his hasty interest when he wanted to go to sleep. She could, she said, kill a man who considered her merely convenient furniture and she uncomfortably emphasized the kill. She expected him to remember her birthday, her taste in wine, her liking for flowers, and her objection to viewing the process of shaving. She wanted a room to herself. She insisted that he knock before entering, and she demanded that he admire her hats. When he was so interested in the work at Pasteur Institute that he had a clerk telephone that he would not be able to meet her for dinner, she was tight-lipped with rage. Oh, you got to expect that, he reflected, feeling that he was being tactful and patient and penetrating. It annoyed him sometimes that she would never impulsively start off on a walk with him. No matter how brief the jaunt, she must first go to her room for white gloves, placidly stand there drawing them on. And in London she made him buy spats, and even wear them. Joyce was not only an arranger, she was a loyalist. Like most American cosmopolites, she revered the English peerage, adopted all their standards and beliefs, or what she considered their standards and beliefs, and treasured her encounters with them. Three and a half years after the war of 1914-18, she still said that she loathed all Germans, and the one complete quarrel between her and Martin occurred when he desired to see the laboratories in Berlin and Vienna. But for all their differences, it was a romantic pilgrimage. They loved fearlessly. They tramped through the mountains and came back to revel in vast bathrooms and ingenious dinners. They idled before cafés, and save when he fell silent, as he remembered how much Leora had wanted to sit before cafés in France, they showed each other all the eagernesses of their minds. Europe, her Europe, which she had always known and loved, Joyce offered to him on generous hands, and he, who had ever been sensitive to warm colors and fine gestures, when he was not frenzied with work, was grateful to her and boyish with wonder. He believed that he was learning to take life easily and beautifully. He criticized Terry Wickett, but only to himself, for provincialism, and so in a golden leisure, 
they came back to America, and prohibition, and politicians charging to protect the steel trust from the communists, to conversation about bridge and motors, and to osmotic pressure determinations. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Director Rippleton Holabird had also married money, and whenever his colleagues hinted that since his first ardent work in physiology he had done nothing but arrange a few nicely selected flowers on the tables hewn out by other men. It was a satisfaction to him to observe that these rotters came down to the institute by subway, while he drove elegantly in his coupe. But now Arrowsmith, once the poorest of them all, came by limousine with a chauffeur who touched his hat, and Holabird's coffee was salted. There was a simplicity in Martin, but it cannot be said that he did not lick his lips when Holabird mooned at the chauffeur. His triumph over Holabird was less than being able to entertain Angus Dewar and his wife, on from Chicago, to introduce them to Director Holabird, to Salomon, the King of Surgeons, and to a medical baronet, and to have Angus gush, Mart, do you mind my saying we're all awfully proud of you? Ransfield was speaking to me about it the other day. It may be presumptuous, he said, but I really feel that perhaps the training we tried to give Dr. Arrowsmith here in the clinic did in some way contribute to his magnificent work in the West Indies and at McGurk. What a lovely woman your wife is, old man. Do you suppose she'd mind telling Mrs. Dewar where she got that frock? Martin had heard about the superiority of poverty to luxury, but after the lunch wagons of Mohalis, after twelve years of helping Leora check the laundry and worry about the price of steak, after a life of waiting in the slush for trolleys, it was not at all dismaying to have a valet who produced shirts automatically, not at all degrading to come to meals which were always interesting, and, in the discretion of his car, to lean an aching head against softness and think how clever he was. You see, by having other people do the vulgar things for you, it saves your own energy for the things that only you can do," said Joyce. Martin agreed, then drove to Westchester for a lesson in golf. A week after their return from Europe, Joyce went with him to see Gottlieb. He fancied that Gottlieb came out of his brooding to smile on them. After all, Martin considered, the old man did like beautiful things. If he'd had the chance, he might have liked a big establishment, too, maybe. Terry was surprisingly complacent. I'll tell you, Slim, if you want to know. Personally, I'd hate to live up to servants. But I'm getting old and wise. I figure that different folks like different things, and awful few of them have the sense to come and ask me what they ought to like. But honest, Slim, I don't think I'll come to dinner. I've gone and bought a dress suit. Bought it! Got it in my room. Damn landlady keeps filling it with mothballs, but I don't think I could stand listening to Latham Ireland being clever. It was, however, Rippleton Holabird's attitude which most concerned Martin, for Holabird did not let him forget that unless he desired to drift off and be merely a ghostly, rich woman's husband, he would do well to remember who was director. Along with the endearing manners which he preserved for Ross McGurk, Holabird had developed the remoteness, the inhuman quiet courtesy, of the man of affairs, and people who presumed on his old glad days he courteously put in their places. He saw the need of repressing insubordination when Arrowsmith appeared in a limousine. He gave him one week after his return to enjoy the limousine, then blandly called on him in his laboratory. "'Martin,' he sighed, I find that our friend Ross McGurk is just a bit dissatisfied with the practical results that are coming out of the Institute, and, to convince him, I'm afraid I really must ask you to put less emphasis on bacteriophage for the moment and take up influenza. The Rockefeller Institute has the right idea. They've utilized their best minds, 
and spent money magnificently on such problems as pneumonia, meningitis, cancer. They've already lessened the terrors of meningitis and pneumonia, and yellow fever is on the verge of complete abolition through Noguchi's work, and I have no doubt that their hospital, with its enormous resources and splendidly cooperating minds, will be the first to find something to alleviate diabetes. Now, I understand, they're hot after the cause of influenza. They're not going to permit another great epidemic of it. Well, dear chap, it's up to us to beat them on the flu, and I've chosen you to represent us in the race. Martin was at the moment hovering over a method of reproducing phage on dead bacteria, but he could not refuse. He could not risk being discharged. He was too rich. Martin, the renegade medical student, could flounder off and be a soda clerk, but if the husband of Joyce Lanyon should indulge in such insanity, he would be followed by reporters and photographed at the soda handles. Still less could he chance becoming merely her supported husband, a butler of the boudoir. He assented, but not very pleasantly. He began to work on the cause of influenza with a half-heartedness almost magnificent. In the hospitals, he secured cultures from cases which might be influenza and might be bad colds. No one was certain just what the influenza symptoms were. Nothing was clean cut. He left most of the work to his assistants, occasionally giving them sardonic directions to put on another hundred tubes of the A medium, hell, make it another thousand. And when he found that they were doing as they pleased, he was not righteous nor rebuking. If he did not guiltily turn his hand from the plough, it was only because he never touched the plough. Once his own small laboratory had been as fussily neat as a New Hampshire kitchen. Now the several rooms under his charge were a disgrace, with long racks of abandoned test-tubes, many half-filled with mould, none of them properly labelled. Then he had his idea. He began firmly to believe that the Rockefeller investigators had found the cause of flu. He gushed in to Holabird and told him so. As for himself, he was going back to his search for the real nature of Fage. Holabird argued that Martin must be wrong. If Holabird wanted the McGurk Institute, and the director of McGurk Institute, to have the credit for capturing influenza, then it simply could not be possible that Rockefeller was ahead of them. He also said weighty things about Fage. Its essential nature, he pointed out, was an academic question. But Martin was by now too much of a scientific dialectician for Holabird, who gave up and retired to his den, or so Martin gloomily believed, to devise new ways of plaguing him. For a time Martin was again left free to wallow in his work. He found a means of reproducing Fage on dead bacteria by a very complicated, very delicate use of partial oxygen-carbon dioxide tension, as exquisite as cameo carving, as improbable as weighing the stars. His report stirred the laboratory world, and here and there, in Tokyo, in Amsterdam, in Winnemac, enthusiasts believed he had proven that Fage was a living organism, and other enthusiasts said, in esoteric language, with mathematical formulae, that he was a liar, and six kinds of a fool. It was at this time, when he might have been a great man, that he pitched over most of his own work and some of the duties of being Joyce's husband to follow Terry Wicket, which showed that he lacked common sense, because Terry was still an assistant, while he himself was head of a department. Terry had discovered that certain quinine derivatives, when introduced into the animal body, slowly decompose into products which are highly toxic to bacteria, but only mildly toxic to the body. There was hinted here a whole new world of therapy. Terry explained it to Martin, and invited him to collaborate. Buoyant with great things, they got leave from Holabird, and from Joyce, and though it was winter, they went off to Bertie's Rest, in the Vermont hills. While they snowshoed and shot rabbits, and all the long dark evenings, while they lay on their bellies before the fire, they ranted and planned. Martin had not been so long silk-wrapped that he could not enjoy gobbling salt pork after the northwest wind and the snow. 
It was not unpleasant to be free of thinking up new compliments for Joyce. They had, they saw, to answer an interesting question. Do the quinine derivatives act by attaching themselves to the bacteria, or by changing the body fluids? It was a simple, clear, definite question, which required for answer only the inmost knowledge of chemistry and biology, a few hundred animals on which to experiment, and perhaps ten or twenty, or a million years, of trying and failing. They decided to work with the pneumococcus, and with the animal which should most nearly reproduce human pneumonia. This meant the monkey, and to murder monkeys is expensive and rather grim. Hollibird, as director, could supply them, but if they took him into confidence, he would demand immediate results. Terry meditated. Remember there was one of these Nobel Prize winners, Slim, one of these plum fanatics that instead of blowing in the prize, spent the whole thing on chimps and other apes, and got together with another of those whiskery old birds, and they ducked up alleys and kept the anti-viv folks from prosecuting them and settled the problem of the transfer of syphilis to lower animals? But we haven't got any Nobel Prize, I grieve to tell you, and it doesn't look to me... Terry, I'll do it if necessary. I've never sponged on Joyce yet, but I will now, if the Holy Wren holds out on us. Part 2 They faced Hollibird in his office, sulkily, rather childishly, and they demanded the expenditure of at least ten thousand dollars for monkeys. They wished to start a research which might take two years without apparent results, possibly without any results. Terry was to be transferred to Martin's department as co-head, their combined salaries shared equally. Then they prepared to fight. Hollibird stared, assembled his mustache, departed from his diligent director manner, and spoke. Wait a minute, if you don't mind. As I gather it, you are explaining to me that occasionally it's necessary to take some time to elaborate an experiment. I really must tell you that I was formerly a researcher in an institute called McGurk, and learned several of these things all by myself. Hell, Terry, and you, Mart, don't be so egotistic. You're not the only scientists who like to work undisturbed. If you poor fish only knew how I long to get away from signing letters and get my fingers on a chymograph drum again, those beautiful long hours of search for truth, and if you knew how I've fought the trustees for the chance to keep you fellows free, all right, you shall have your monkeys, fix up the joint department to suit yourselves, and work ahead as seems best. I doubt if in the whole scientific world there's two people that can be trusted as much as you two surly birds. Hollibird rose, straight and handsome and cordial, his hand out. They sheepishly shook it, and sneaked away, Terry grumbling, He spoiled my whole day. I haven't got a single thing to kick about. Slim, where's the catch? You can bet there is one. There always is. In a year of divine work, the catch did not appear. They had their monkeys, their laboratories and garçons, and their unbroken leisure. They began the most exciting work they had ever known, and decidedly the most nerve-jabbing. Monkeys are unreasonable animals. They delight in developing tuberculosis on no provocation whatever. In captivity, they have a liking for epidemics, and they make scenes by cursing at their masters in seven dialects. They're so up and coming, sighed Terry. I feel like letting them go and retiring to Bertie's rest to grow potatoes. Why should we murder live wires like them to save pasty-faced, big-bellied humans from pneumonia? Their first task was to determine with accuracy the tolerated dose of the quinine derivative, and to study its effects on the hearing and vision, and on the kidneys, as shown by endless determinations of blood sugar and blood urea. While Martin did the injections, and observed the effect on the monkeys, and lost himself in chemistry, Terry toiled, all night, all next day, then a drink, and a frowsy nap, and all night again, on new methods of synthesizing the quinine derivative. This was the most difficult period of Martin's life, to work, staggering sleepy, all night, 
to drowse on a bare table at dawn, and to breakfast at a greasy lunch counter. These were natural and amusing. But to explain to Joyce why he had missed her dinner to a lady sculptor and a lawyer whose grandfather had been a Confederate general, this was impossible. He won a brief tolerance by explaining that he really had longed to kiss her good night, that he did appreciate the basket of sandwiches which she had sent, and that he was about to remove pneumonia from the human race, a statement which he healthily doubted. But when he had missed four dinners in succession, when she had raged, can you imagine how awful it was for Mrs. Thorne to be short a man at the last moment? When she had wailed, I didn't so much mind your rudeness on the other nights, but this evening, when I had nothing to do, and sat home alone, and waited for you, then he writhed. Martin and Terry began to produce pneumonia in their monkeys, and to treat them, and they had success which caused them to waltz solemnly down the corridor. They could save the monkeys from pneumonia invariably, when the infection had gone but one day, and most of them on the second day and the third. Their results were complicated by the fact that a certain number of the monkeys recovered by themselves, and this they allowed for by simple-looking figures which took days of stiff, shoulder-aching sitting over papers, one wild-haired, collarless man at a table, while the other walked among stinking cages of monkeys, clucking to them, calling them Bess and Rover, and grunting placidly, Oh, you would bite me, would you, sweetheart? And all the while, kindly but merciless as the gods, injecting them with the deadly pneumonia. They came into a high upland, where the air was thin with failures. They studied in the test tube the breakdown products of pneumococci, and failed. They constructed artificial body fluids, carefully, painfully, inadequately. They tried the effect of the derivative on germs in this artificial blood, and failed. Then Holabird heard of their previous success, and came down on them with laurels and fury. He understood, he said, that they had a cure for pneumonia. Very well. The Institute could do with the credit for curing that undesirable disease, and Terry and Martin would kindly publish their findings, mentioning McGurk, at once. We will not. Look here, Holabird, snarled Terry. I thought you were going to let us alone. I have. Nearly a year. Till you should complete your research. And now you've completed it. It's time to let the world know what you're doing. If I did, the world would know a doggone sight more than I do. Nothing doing, Chief. Maybe we can publish in a year from now. You'll publish now, or... All right, Holly. The blessed moment has arrived. I quit. And I'm so gentlemanly that I do it without telling you what I think of you. Thus was Terry Wickett discharged from McGurk. He patented the process of synthesizing his quinine derivative, and retired to Bertie's rest, to build a laboratory out of his small savings, and spend a life of independent research, supported by a restricted sale of Syra and of his drug. For Terry, wifeless and valetless, this was easy enough, but for Martin it was not simple. Part 3 Martin assumed that he would resign. He explained it to Joyce, how he was to combine a townhouse and a Greenwich castle, with flannel shirt collaboration at Bertie's rest, he had not quite planned, but he was not going to be disloyal. Can you beat it? The Holy Wren fires Terry, but doesn't dare touch me. I waited, simply because I wanted to watch Holabird figure out what I'd do, and now... He was elucidating it to her in their, in her, car on the way home from a dinner at which he had been so gaily charming to an important dowager that Joyce had crooned, what a fool Latham Ireland was to say he couldn't be polite. I'm free, by thunder, at last I'm free, because I've worked up to something that's worth being free for, he exulted. She laid her fine hand on his and begged, wait, I want to think, please, do be quiet a moment. Then, Mart, if you went on working with Mr. Wicket, you'd have to be leaving me constantly. Well, I really don't think that would be quite nice. I mean, especially now, because I fancy I'm going to have a baby. 
He made a sound of surprise. Oh, I'm not going to do the weeping mother. And I don't know whether I'm glad or furious, though I do believe I'd like to have one baby. But it does complicate things, you know. And personally, I should be sorry if you left the Institute, which gives you a solid position for a hole-and-corner existence. Dear, I've been fairly nice, haven't I? I really do like you, you know. I don't want you to desert me, and you would if you went off to this horrid Vermont place. Couldn't we get a little house there and spend part of the year? Possibly, but we ought to wait till this beastly job of bearing a dear little one is over. Then think about it. Martin did not resign from the Institute, and Joyce did not think about taking a house near Bertie's rest to the extent of doing it. End of chapter 38「Chapter Thirty Nine of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With Terry Wicket gone, Martin returned to Fage. He made a false start and did the worst work of his life. He had lost his fierce serenity. He was too conscious of the ordeal of a professional social life, and he could never understand that esoteric phenomenon, the dinner party the painful entertainment of people whom he neither likes nor finds interesting. So long as he had had a refuge in talking to Terry, he had not been too irritated by well-dressed non-entities, and for a time he had enjoyed the dramatic game of making nice people accept him. Now he was disturbed by reason. Cliff Clausen showed him how tangled his life had grown. When he had first come to New York, Martin had looked for Cliff, whose boisterousness had been his comfort among Angus Dewar's and Irving Waters's in medical school. Cliff was not to be found, neither at the motor agency for which he had once worked, nor elsewhere on Automobile Row. For fourteen years Martin had not seen him. Then to his laboratory at McGurk was brought a black and red card. Clifford L. Clausen, Cliff. Top-notch guaranteed oil investments. Higgum Block, Butte. Cliff, good old Cliff. The best friend a man ever had. That time he lent me the money to get to Leora. Old Cliff. By golly, I need somebody like him, with Terry out of it and all these tea-hounds around me, exulted Martin. He dashed out and stopped abruptly, staring at a man who was, not softly, remarking to the girl reception clerk. Well, sister, you scientific birds certainly do lay on the agony. Never struck a sweller layout than you got here, except in crook investment offices, and I've never seen a nicer cutie than you anywhere. How about little dinner, one of these beauteous evenings? I expect I'll parley-vous with thou full often now. I'm a great friend of Doc Arrowsmith. Fact, I'm a doc myself. Honest, real sawbones, went to medic school and everything. Ah, here's the boy. Martin had not allowed for the change of fourteen years. He was dismayed. Cliff Clausen, at forty, was gross. His face was sweaty and puffy with pale flesh. His voice was raw. He fancied checked Norfolk jackets, tight across his swollen shoulders and his beefy hips. He bellowed while he belabored Martin's back. Well, 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 old Mart. Why, you old son of a gun. Why, you old son of a gun. Why, you damn old chicken thief. Say, you skinny little runt, I'm a son of a gun if you look one day older than when I saw you last in Zenith. Martin was aware of the bright leering of the once humble reception clerk. He said, well, gosh, it certainly is good to see you, and hastened to get Cliff into the privacy of his office. You look fine, he lied, when they were safe. What you been doing with yourself? Leora and I did our best to look you up when we first came to New York. Uh, do you know about, uh, about her? Yeah, I read about her passing away. Fierce luck. And about your swell work in the West Indies. Where was it? 
I guess you're a great man now, famous plague chaser and all that stuff, and world-renowned ski -intist. I don't suppose you remember your old friends now. Oh, don't be a chump. It's, it's, it's fine to see you. Well, I'm glad to observe you haven't got the capitus enlargitus, Mart. Golly, I says to meself, says I, if I blew in and old Mart high-hatted me, I'd just about come nigh unto letting him hear the straight truth, after all the compliments he's been getting from society dames. I'm glad you've kept your head. I thought about writing you from Butte, been selling some bum oil stock there, and kind of got out quick to save the inspectors the trouble of looking over my books. Well, I thought, I'll just sit down and write the way-faced runt a letter, and make him feel good by telling him how tickled I am over his nice work. But you know how it is, time kind of slips by. Well, this is excellentus. We'll have a chance to see a whole lot of each other now. I'm going in with a fellow on an investment stunt here in New York. Great pickings, old kid. I'll take you out and show you how to order a real feed one of these days. Well, tell me what you've been doing since you got back from the West Indies. I suppose you're laying your plans to try to get in as the boss or president or whatever they call it of this celebrated institute. No, I... Uh, well, I shouldn't much care to be director. I prefer sticking to my lab. I... Perhaps you'd like to hear about my work on Fage. Rejoicing to discover something of which he could talk, Martin sketched his experiments. Cliff spanked his forehead with a spongy hand and shouted, Wait, say, I've got an idea. You can come right in on it. As I apperceive it, the dear old gen public is just beginning to hear about this back. What is it? Bacteriophage junk? Look here. Remember that old scoundrel Benoni Carr that I introduced as a great pharmacologist at the medical banquet? Had din, din with him last eventide. He's running a sanitarium out on Long Island. Slick idea, too. Practically, he's a bootlegger. Gets a lot of high rollers out there and lets them have all the hooch they want on prescriptions absolutely legal and watertight. The parties they throw at that joint, dames and everything. Believe me, Uncle Cliff is sore-stricken with tootalus bootalus and is going to the car sanitarium for what ails him. But now look. Suppose we got him or somebody to rig up a new kind of cure. Call it phagiotherapy. Oh, it takes Uncle Cliff to invent the names that claw in the bounteous dollars. Patients sit in a steam cabinet and eat tablets made of phage, with just a little strychnine to jazz up their hearts. Brand new. Million in it. What you think? Martin was almost feeble. No, I'm afraid I'm against it. Why? Well, I... Honestly, Cliff, if you don't understand it, I don't know how I can explain the scientific attitude to you. You know, that's what Gottlieb used to call it, scientific attitude. And as I'm a scientist, least I hope I am, I couldn't, well, be associated with a thing like that. But, you poor louse, don't you suppose I understand the scientific attitude? Gosh! I've seen a dissecting room myself. Why, you poor crab, of course I wouldn't expect you to have your name associated with it. You'd keep in the background and slip us all the dope and get a lot of publicity for Fage in general so the DIA people would fall easier and we'd pull all the strong arm work. But I hope you're joking, Cliff. If you weren't joking, I'd tell you that if anybody tried to pull a thing like that, I'd expose them and get them sent to jail, no matter who they were. Well, gosh, if you feel that way about it. Cliff was peering over the fatty pads beneath his eyes. He sounded doubtful. I suppose you have the right to keep other guys from grabbing your own stuff. Well, all right, Mart. Got to be tillodling. Tell you what you might do, though, if that don't hurt your tender conscience, too. You might invite old Cliff up to the house for dinner to meet the new little wifey that I read about in the society journals. You might happen to remember, old Bean, that there have been times when you were glad enough to let poor fat old Cliff 
slip you a feed and a place to sleep. Oh, I know, you bet there have. Nobody was ever decenter to me. Nobody. Look, where are you staying? I'll find out from my wife what dates we have ahead and to telephone you tomorrow morning. So you let the old woman keep the worksheet for you, huh? Well, I never butt into anybody's business. I'm staying at the Barrington Hotel, room 617. Remember that, 617. That you might try and phone me before 10 tomorrow. Say, that's one grand sweet song of a cutie you got on the door here. What you think? How's chances on dragging her out to feed and shake a hoof with Uncle Cliff? As primly as the oldest, most staid scientist in the Institute, Martin protested, Oh, she belongs to very nice family. I don't think I should try it. Really, I'd rather you didn't. Cliff's gaze was sharp, for all its fattiness. With excessive cordiality, with excessive applause, when Cliff remarked, You better go back to work and put some salt on a couple of bacteria's tails. Martin guided him to the reception room, safely past the girl clerk, and to the elevator. For a long time he sat in his office and was thoroughly wretched. He had for years pictured Cliff Clawson as another Terry Wicket. He saw that Cliff was as different from Terry as from Rippleton Hollibird. Terry was rough, he was surly, he was colloquial, he despised many fine and gracious things, he offended many fine and gracious people, but these acerbities made up the haircloth robe wherewith he defended a devotion to such holy work as no cowled monk ever knew. But Cliff! I'll do the world a service by killing that man, Martin fretted. Fagiotherapy at a yegg sanitarium. I stand him only because I'm too much of a coward to risk his going around saying that in the days of my success I've gone back on my old friends. Success! Puddling at work, dinners, talking to idiotic women, being furious because you weren't invited to the dinner to the Portuguese minister. No, I'll phone Cliff. We can't have him at the house. Over him came remembrance of Cliff's loyalty in the old barren days, and Cliff's joy to share with him every pathetic gain. Why should he understand my feeling about Fage? Was his scheme any worse than plenty of reputable drug firms? How much was I righteously offended, and how much was I sore because he didn't recognize the high social position of the rich Dr. Arrowsmith? He gave up the question, went home, explained almost frankly to Joyce what her probable opinion of Cliff would be, and contrived that Cliff should be invited to dinner with only the two of them. "'My dear Mart,' said Joyce, "'why do you insult me by hinting that I'm such a snob that I'll be offended by racy slang and by business ethics very much like those of dear Roger's grandpapa? Do you think I've never ventured out of the drawing-room?' I thought you'd see me outside it. I shall probably like your Clausen person very much indeed. The day after Martin had invited him to dinner, Cliff telephoned to Joyce. This Mrs. Arrowsmith? Well, say, this is old Cliff. I'm afraid I didn't quite catch it. Cliff, old Cliff. I'm frightfully sorry, but perhaps there's a bad connection. Why, it's Mr. Clausen. It's going to feed with you on... Oh, of course, I am so sorry. Well, look, what I wanted to know is, is this going to be just a homey grub-grabbing or a real soiree? In other words, honey, shall I dress natural or do I put on the soup and fish? Oh, I got em, swallowtail and the whole darn outfit. I, do you mean... Oh, shall you dress for dinner? I think perhaps I would... Atta boy, I'll be there, dolled up like a new saloon. I'll show you folks the cutest little line of jeweled studs you ever laid eyes on. Well, it's been a great pleasure to meet Mart's missus, and we will now close with singing Till We Meet Again, or Aw Reservoir. When Martin came home, Joyce faced him with, Sweet, I can't do it. The man must be mad. Really, dear, you just take care of him and let me go to bed. 
Besides, you two won't want me. You'll want to talk over old times, and I'd only interfere. And with baby coming in two months now, I ought to go to bed early. Oh, Joy, Cliff'll be awfully offended, and he's always been so decent to me, and you've often asked me about my cub days. Don't you want, plaintively, to hear about him? Very well, dear. I'll try to be a little sunbeam to him. But I warn you, I shan't be a success. They worked themselves up to a belief that Cliff would be raucous, would drink too much, and slap Joyce on the back. But when he appeared for dinner, he was agonizingly polite and flowery, till he became slightly drunk. When Martin said, damn, Cliff reproved him with, of course I'm only a hick, but I don't think a lady like the princess here would like you to cuss. And, well, I never expected a rube like young Mart to marry the real Bon Ton article. And, oh, maybe it didn't cost something to furnish this dining room. Oh, not a tall. And, champagne, eh? Well, you're certainly doing poor old Cliff proud. Your Majesty, just tell your high dingbat to tell his valet, to tell my secretary, the address of your bootlegger, will you? In his cups, though he severely retained his moral and elegant vocabulary, Cliff chronicled the jest of selling oil wells unprovided with oil, and of escaping before the law closed in, the cleverness of joining churches for the purpose of selling stock to the members, and the edifying experience of assisting Dr. Benoni Carr to capture a rich and senile widow for his sanitarium by promising to provide medical consultation from the spirit world. Joyce was silent through it all, and so superbly polite that everyone was wretched. Martin struggled to make a liaison between them, and he had no elevating remarks about the strangeness of a man's boasting of his own crookedness, but he was coldly furious when Cliff blundered, you said old Gottlieb was sort of down on his luck now. Yes, he's not very well. Poor old coot, but I guess you've realized by now how foolish you were when you used to fall for him like seven and a half brick. Honestly, Lady Arrowsmith, this kid used to think Pa Gottlieb was the cat's pajamas, begging your pardon for the slanguageness. What do you mean? said Martin. Oh, I'm on to Gottlieb. Of course you know as well as I do that he always was a self-advertiser, getting himself talked about by confiding to the whole ops terrara what a strict scientist he was, and putting on a lot of dog, and emitting these wisecracks about philosophy, and what fierce guys the regular docs were. But what's worse than... Out in San Diego, I ran onto a fellow that used to be an instructor in botany in Winnemac and he told me that with all this antibody stuff of his, Gottlieb never gave any credit to... Well, he was some Russian that did most of it before, and Pa Gottlieb stole all his stuff. That in this charge against Gottlieb there was a hint of truth, that he knew the great God to have been at times ungenerous, merely increased the rage which was clenching Martin's fist in his lap. Three years before, he would have thrown something, but he was an adaptable person. He had yielded to Joyce's training in being quietly, instead of noisily, disagreeable. And his only comment was, No, I think you're wrong, Cliff. Gottlieb has carried the antibody work way beyond all the others. Before the coffee and liqueurs had come into the drawing room, Joyce begged, at her prettiest, Mr. Clausen, do you mind awfully if I slip up to bed? I'm so frightfully glad to have had the opportunity of meeting one of my husband's oldest friends, but I'm not feeling very well, and I do think I'd be wise to have some rest. Madam the Princess, I noticed you were looking peaked. Oh, well, good night. Martin and Cliff settled in large chairs in the drawing room, and tried to play at being old friends happy in meeting. They did not look at each other. After Cliff had cursed a little, and told three sound smutty stories to show that he had not been spoiled, and that he had been elegant only to delight Joyce, he flung, Huh, so that is that. 
as the Englishers remark, well, I could see your old lady didn't cotton to me. She was just as chummy as an iceberg. But gosh, I don't mind. She's going to have a kid, and of course women, all of them, get cranky when they're that way. But... He hiccuped, looked sage, and bolted his fifth cognac. But what I never could figure out, mind you, I'm not criticizing the old lady. She's as swell as they make em. But what I can't understand is how after living with Leora, who was the real thing, you can stand a hoity-toity skirt like Joycey. Then Martin broke. The misery of not being able to work, these months since Terry had gone, had gnawed at him. Look here, Cliff. I won't have you discuss my wife. I'm sorry she doesn't please you, but I'm afraid that in this particular matter... Cliff had risen, not too steadily, though his voice and his eyes were resolute. All right, I figured out you were going to hi-hat me. Of course I haven't got a rich wife to slip me money. I'm just a plain old hobo. I don't belong in a place like this. Not smooth enough to be a butler. You are. All right, I wish you luck. And meanwhile, you can go plumb to hell, my young friend. Martin did not pursue him into the hall. As he sat alone, he groaned. Thank heaven that operation's over. He told himself that Cliff was a crook, a fool, and a fat waster. He told himself that Cliff was a cynic without wisdom, a drunkard without charm, and a philanthropist who was generous only because it larded his vanity. But these admirable truths did not keep the operation from hurting any more than it would have eased the removal of an appendix to be told that it was a bad appendix, an appendix without delicacy or value. He had loved Cliff, did love him and always would, but he would never see him again, never. The impertinence of that flabby blackguard to sneer at Gottlieb, his boorishness. Life was too short for... But hang it, yes, Cliff is a tough, but so am I. He's a crook, but wasn't I a crook to fake my plage figures in St. Hubert, and the worst crook because I got praise for it? He bobbed up to Joyce's room. She was lying in her immense four-poster, reading Peter Whiffle. Darling, it was all rather dreadful, wasn't it? She said. He's gone? Yes, he's gone. I've driven out the best friend I ever had, practically. I let him go, let him go off feeling that he was a rotter and a failure. It would have been decenter to have killed him. Oh, why couldn't you have been simple and jolly with him? You were so confoundedly polite. He was uneasy and unnatural, and showed up worse than he really is. He's no tougher than... He's a lot better than the financiers who cover up their stuff by being suave. Poor devil. I'll bet right now Cliff's tramping in the rain, saying, The one man I ever loved and tried to do things for has turned against me. Now he's... Now he has a lovely wife. What's the use of ever being decent? He's saying, Why couldn't you be simple and chuck your highfalutin manners for once? See here, you disliked him quite as much as I did, and I will not have you blame it on me. You've grown beyond him. You, that are always blaring about facts, can't you face the fact? For once at least it's not my fault. You may perhaps remember, my king of men, that I had the good sense to suggest that I shouldn't appear tonight, not meet him at all. Oh, well, yes, gosh, but... Oh, I suppose so. Well, anyway, it's over, and that's all there is to it. Darling, I do understand how you feel. But isn't it good it is over? Kiss me good night. But, Martin said to himself, as he sat feeling naked and lost and homeless, in the dressing gown of gold dragonflies on black silk, which she had bought for him in Paris, but if it had been Leora instead of Joyce, Leora would have known Cliff was a crook, and she'd have accepted it as a fact. Talk about your facing facts. She wouldn't have insisted on sitting as a judge. She wouldn't have said, This is different from me, so it's wrong. She'd have said, This is different from me, so it's interesting. Leora... He had a sharp, terrifying vision of her, lying there coffinless, 
below the mould, in a garden on the Penrith Hills. He came out of it to growl, What was it Cliff said? You're not her husband, you're her butler, you're too smooth. He was right. The whole point is, I'm not allowed to see who I want to. I've been so clever that I've made myself the slave of Joyce and Holy Hollibird. He was always going to, but he never did, see Cliff Clawson again. Part 2 It happened that both Joyce's and Martin's paternal grandfathers had been named John, and John Arrowsmith they called their son. They did not know it, but a certain John Arrowsmith, mariner of Biddeford, had died in the matter of the Spanish Armada, taking with him five valorous dons. Joyce suffered horribly, and renewed all of Martin's love for her. He did love pitifully this slim, brilliant girl. "'Death's a better game than bridge. You have no partner to help you,' she said, when she was grotesquely stretched on a chair of torture and indignity. When, before they would give her the anaesthetic, her face was green with agony. John Arrowsmith was straight of back and straight of limb. Ten good pounds he weighed at birth, and he was gay of eye when he had ceased to be a raw wrinkled grub and become a man-child. Joyce worshipped him, and Martin was afraid of him, because he saw that this minuscule aristocrat, this child born to the self-approval of riches, would some day condescend to him. Three months after childbearing, Joyce was more brisk than ever about putting and backhand service and hats and Russian emigres. Part three. For science, Joyce had great respect and no understanding. Often she asked Martin to explain his work, but when he was glowing, making diagrams with his thumbnail on the tablecloth, she would interrupt him with a gracious, Darling, do you mind? Just a second. Plinder, isn't there any more of the sherry? When she turned back to him, though her eyes were kind, his enthusiasm was gone. She came to his laboratory, asked to see his flasks and tubes, and begged him to bully her into understanding, but she never sat back, watching for silent hours. Suddenly, in his bogged floundering in the laboratory, he touched solid earth. He blundered into the effect of Fage on the mutation of bacterial species, very beautiful, very delicate, and after plodding months when he had been a sane citizen, an almost good husband, an excellent bridge player, and a rotten workman, he knew again the happiness of high, taut insanity. He wanted to work nights, every night. During his uninspired fumbling, there had been nothing to hold him at the Institute after five, and Joyce had become used to having him flee to her. Now he showed an inconvenient ability to ignore engagements, to snap at delightful guests who asked him to explain all about science, to forget even her and the baby. I've got to work evenings, he said. I can't be regular and easy about it when I'm caught by a big experiment, any more than you could be regular and easy and polite when you were gestating the baby. I know, but... Darling, you get so nervous when you're working like this. Heavens, I don't care how much you offend people by missing engagements. Well, after all, I wish you wouldn't, but I do know it may be unavoidable. But when you make yourself so drawn and trembly, are you gaining time in the long run? It's just for your own sake. Oh, I have it. Wait, you'll see what a scientist I am. No, I won't explain. Not yet. Joyce had wealth and energy. A week later, flushed, slim, gallant, joyous, she said to him after dinner, I've got a surprise for you. She led him to the unoccupied rooms over the garage, behind their house. In that week, using a score of workmen from the most immaculate and elaborate scientific supply house in the country, she had created for him the best bacteriological laboratory he had ever seen white tile floor and enameled brick walls, icebox and incubator, glassware and stains and microscope, a perfect constant temperature bath, 
and a technician, trained in Lister and Rockefeller, who had his bedroom behind the laboratory, and who announced his readiness to serve Dr. Arrowsmith day or night. There, sang Joyce, now when you simply must work evenings, you won't have to go clear down to Liberty Street. You can duplicate your cultures, or whatever you call them. If you're bored at dinner, all right. You can slip out here afterward, and work as late as ever you want. Is, sweet, is it all right? Have I done it right? I tried so hard. I got the best men I could. While his lips were against hers, he brooded. To have done this for me, and to be so humble. And now, curse it, I'll never be able to get away by myself. She so joyfully demanded his finding some fault that, to give her the novel pleasure of being meek, he suggested that the centrifuge was inadequate. "'You wait, my man!' she crowed. Two evenings later, when they had returned from the opera, she led him to the cement-floored garage beneath his new laboratory, and in a corner, ready to be set up, was a second-hand but adequate centrifuge, the most adequate centrifuge, the masterpiece of the great firm of Berkeley Saunders, in fact, none other than Gladys, whose dismissal from McGurk, for her sluttish ways, had stirred Martin and Terry to go out and get bountifully drunk. It was less easy for him, this time, to be grateful, but he worked at it. Part 4 Through both the economico-literary and the Rolls-Royce sections of Joyce's set, the rumor panted that there was a new diversion in an exhausted world, going out to Martin's laboratory and watching him work, and being ever so silent and reverent, except, perhaps, when Joyce murmured, "'Isn't he adorable the way he teaches his darling bacteria to say, "'Pretty Polly?' or when Latham Ireland convulsed them by arguing that scientists had no sense of humor, or Sammy de Lembre burst out in his marvelous burlesque of jazz. Oh, Mr. Baxillilis, don't you grin at me, you microbiologic cuss, I'm on to thee. When Mr. Dr. Arrowsmith's done looking at de clues, you'll sit in jail a-singin' dem bacteria blues. Joyce's cousin from Georgia sparkled, Mart is so cute with all those little vases of his, but I can't always get him so mad by telling him the trouble with him is he don't go to church often enough. While Martin sought to concentrate. They flocked from the house to his laboratory only once a week, which was certainly not enough to disturb a resolute man, merely enough to keep him constantly waiting for them. When he sedately tried to explain this and that to Joyce, she said, Did we bother you this evening? But they do admire you so. He remarked, Well, and went to bed. R. A. Hopburn, the eminent patent lawyer, as he drove away from the Arrowsmith Lanyon mansion, grunted to his wife, I don't mind a host throwing the port at you if he thinks you're a chump but I do mind his being bored at your daring to express any opinion whatever. Didn't he look silly out in his idiotic laboratory? How the deuce do you suppose Joyce ever came to marry him? I can't imagine. I can only think of one reason. Of course she may. Now please don't be filthy. Well, anyway... She who might have picked any number of well-bred, agreeable, intelligent chaps, and I mean intelligent, because this Arrowsmith person may know all about germs, but he doesn't know a symphony from a savory. I don't think I'm too fussy, but I don't quite see why we should go to a house where the host apparently enjoys flatly contradicting you. Poor devil, I'm really sorry for him. Probably he doesn't even know when he's being rude. No, perhaps. What hurts is to think of old Roger, so gay, so strong, real skull and bones, to have this abrupt outsider from the tall grass sitting in his chair, failing to appreciate his Paul Roger. What Joyce ever saw in him, though he does have nice eyes and such funny strong hands. 
Part 6 Joyce's busyness was on his nerves. Why she was so busy, it was hard to ascertain. She had an excellent housekeeper, a noble butler, and two nurses for the baby. But she often said that she was never allowed to attain her one ambition, to sit and read. Terry had once called her the arranger, and though Martin resented it, when he heard the telephone bell, he groaned, Oh, Lord, there's the arranger. Wants me to come to tea with some high-minded hen. When he sought to explain that he must be free from entanglements, she suggested, Are you such a weak, irresolute, little man, that the only way you can keep concentrated is by running away? Are you afraid of the big men who can do big work and still stop and play? He was likely to turn abusive, particularly as to her definition of big men, and when he became hot and vulgar, she turned grande dame, so that he felt like an impertinent servant and was the more vulgar. He was afraid of her then. He imagined fleeing to Leora, and the two of them, frightened little people, comforting each other and hiding from her in snug corners. But often enough, Joyce was his companion, seeking new amusements as surprises for him, and in their son they had a binding pride. He sat watching little John, rejoicing in his strength. It was in early winter, after she had royally taken the baby south for a fortnight, that Martin escaped for a week with Terry at Bertie's rest. He found Terry tired and a little surly, after months of working absolutely alone. He had constructed beside the home cabin a shanty for laboratory and a rough stable for the horses which he used in the preparation of the Sierra. Terry did not, as he once would have, flare into the details of his research, but not till evening, when they smoked before the rough fireplace of the cabin, loafing in chairs made of barrels cushioned with elk skin, could Martin coax him into confidences. He had been compelled to give up much of his time to mere housework and the production of the Sira which paid his expenses. If you'd only been with me, I could have accomplished something. But his quinine derivative research had gone on solidly, and he did not regret leaving McGurk. He had found it impossible to work with monkeys. They were too expensive and too fragile to stand the Vermont winter but he had contrived a method of using mice infected with pneumococcus, and... Oh, what's the use of my telling you this, Slim? You're not interested, or you'd have been up here at work with me months ago. You've chosen between Joyce and me. All right, but you can't have both. Martin snarled. I'm very sorry I intruded on you, Wicket, and slammed out of the cabin. Stumbling through the snow, blundering in darkness against stumps, he knew the agony of his last hour, the hour of failure. I've lost Terry now, though I won't stand his impertinence. I've lost everybody, and I've never really had Joyce. I'm completely alone, and I can only half work. I'm through. They'll never let me get to work again. Suddenly, without arguing it out, he knew that he was not going to give up. He floundered back to the cabin and burst in, crying, You old grouch, we got to stick together. Terry was as much moved as he. Neither of them was far from tears, and as they roughly patted each other's shoulders, they growled, Fine pair of fools, scrapping just because we're tired. I will come and work with you somehow, Martin swore. I'll get a six months leave from the Institute and have Joyce stay at some hotel near here, or do something. Gee, back to real work. Work. Now tell me, when I come up here, what do you say we... They talked till dawn. End of chapter 39「Chapter Forty of Arrowsmith」by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. and Mrs. Rippleton Hollibird 
had invited only Joyce and Martin to dinner. Hollibird was his most charming self. He admired Joyce's pearls, and when the squabs had been served, he turned on Martin with friendly intensity. Now will Joyce and you listen to me most particularly? Things are happening, Martin, and I want you, no, science wants you, to take your proper part in them. I needn't, by the way, hint that this is absolutely confidential. Dr. Tubbs and his League of Cultural Agencies are beginning to accomplish marvels, and Colonel Minigan has been extraordinarily liberal. They've gone at the League with exactly the sort of thoroughness, and taking it slow, that you and dear old Gottlieb have always insisted on. For four years now, they've stuck to making plans. I happen to know that Dr. Tubbs and the Council of the League have had the most wonderful conferences with college presidents and editors and club women and labor leaders, the sound, sensible ones, of course, and efficiency experts and the more advanced advertising men and ministers and all the other leaders of public thought. They've worked out elaborate charts classifying all intellectual occupations and interests with the methods and materials and tools, and especially the goals, the aims, the ideals, the moral purposes that are suited to each of them. Really tremendous! Why, a musician or an engineer, for example, could look at his chart and tell accurately whether he was progressing fast enough at his age, and if not, just what his trouble was, and the remedy. With this basis, the League is ready to go to work and encourage all brain workers to affiliate. McGurk Institute simply must get in on this coordination, which I regard as one of the greatest advances in thinking that has ever been made. We are at last going to make all the erstwhile chaotic spiritual activities of America really conform to the American ideal. We're going to make them as practical and supreme as the manufacture of cash registers. I have certain reasons for supposing I can bring Ross McGurk and Minigan together, now that the McGurk and Minigan lumber interests have stopped warring. And if so, I shall probably quit the Institute and help Tubbs guide the League of Cultural Agencies. Then we'll need a new director of McGurk, who will work with us and help us bring science out of the monastery to serve mankind. By this time, Martin understood everything about the League, except what the League was trying to do. Hollibird went on, Now I know, Martin, that you've always rather sneered at practicalness, but I have faith in you. I believe you've been too much under the influence of Wicket, and now that he's gone, and you've seen more of life, and of Joyce's set and mine, I believe I can coax you to take... Oh, without in any way neglecting the severities of your lab work, a broader view. I am authorized to appoint an assistant director, and I think I am safe in saying he would succeed me as full director. Schultes wants the place, and Dr. Smith and Yeo would leap at it, but I haven't yet found any of them that are quite our own sort, and I offer it to you. I dare say, in a year or two, you will be director of McGurk Institute. Hollibird was uplifted as one giving royal favor. Mrs. Hollibird was intense as one present on an historical occasion, and Joyce was ecstatic over the honor to her man. Martin stammered, w Why, I'll have to think it over. Sort of unexpected. The rest of the evening, Hollibird so brimmingly enjoyed himself, picturing an era in which Tubbs and Martin and he would rule, coordinate, standardize, and make useful the whole world of intelligence, from trousers designing to poetry, that he did not resent Martin's silence. At parting he chanted, Talk it over with Joyce, and let me have your decision tomorrow. By the way, I think we'll get rid of Pearl Robbins. She's been useful, but now she considers herself indispensable. But that's a detail. Oh, I do have faith in you, Martin, dear old boy. You've grown and calmed down, and you've widened your interest so much this past year. In their car, in that moving, curtained room under the crystal dome light, Joyce beamed at him. 
Isn't it too wonderful, Mart? And I do feel Rippleton can bring it off. Think of your being director, head of that whole great institute, when just a few years ago you were only a cub there. But haven't I perhaps helped just a little? Suddenly Martin hated the blue and gold velvet of the car, the cunningly hid gold box of cigarettes, all this soft and smothering prison. He wanted to be out beside the unseen chauffeur, his own sort, facing the winter. He tried to look as though he were meditating, in an awed, appreciative manner, but he was merely being cowardly, reluctant to begin the slaughter. Slowly. Would you really like to see me, director? Of course. All that? Oh, you know, I don't just mean the prominence and respect, but the power to accomplish good. Would you like to see me dictating letters, giving out interviews, buying linoleum, having lunch with distinguished fools, advising men about whose work I don't know a blamed thing? Oh, don't be so superior. Someone has to do these things, and that'd be only a small part of it. Think of the opportunity of encouraging some youngster who wanted a chance to do splendid science. And give up my own chance? Why need you? You'd be head of your own department just the same. And even if you did give up, you are so stubborn. It's lack of imagination. You think that because you've started in on one tiny branch of mental activity, there's nothing else in the world. It's just as when I persuaded you that if you got out of your stinking laboratory once a week or so, and actually bent your powerful intellect to a game of golf, the world of science wouldn't immediately stop. No imagination. You're precisely like these businessmen you're always cursing, because they can't see anything in life beyond their soap factories or their banks. And you really would have me give up my work? He saw that, with all her eager complacencies, she had never understood what he was up to, had not comprehended one word about the murderous effect of the directorship on Gottlieb. He was silent again, and before they reached home, she said only, You know I'm the last person to speak of money, but really, it's you who have so often brought up the matter of hating to be dependent on me, and you know as director you would make so much more that... Forgive me. She fled before him, into her palace, into the automatic elevator. He plodded up the stairs, grumbling. Yes, it is the first chance I've had to really contribute to the expenses here. Sure, willing to take her money, but not do anything in return, and then call it devotion to science. Well, I've got to decide right now. He did not go through the turmoil of deciding. He leaped to decision without it. He marched into Joyce's room, irritated by its snobbishness of discreet color. He was checked by the miserable way in which she sat brooding on the edge of her day couch, but he flung. I'm not going to do it, even if I have to leave the Institute, and Hollibird will just about make me quit. I will not get buried in this pompous fakery of giving orders and... Mart, listen, don't you want your son to be proud of you? Uh, well, no, not if he's to be proud of me for being a stuffed shirt. A sideshow, Barker. Please, don't be vulgar. Why not? Matter of fact, I haven't been vulgar enough lately. What I ought to do is to go to Bertie's rest right now and work with Terry. I wish I had some way of showing you, oh, for a scientist, you do have the most incredible blind spots. I wish I could make you see just how weak and futile that is. The wilds, the simple life, the old argument... It's just the absurd, cowardly sort of thing these tired highbrows do that sneak off to some esoteric colony and think they're getting strength to conquer life, when they're merely running away from it. No, Terry has his place in the country, only because he can live cheaper there. If we, if he could afford it, he'd probably be right here in town, with garçons and everything, like McGurk, but with no director Holliburg, by God, and no director Arrowsmith. Merely a cursing, ill-bred, intensely selfish director Terry Wicket. Now, by God, let me tell you. 
Martin, do you need to emphasize your arguments by a by God in every sentence, or have you a few other expressions in your highly scientific vocabulary? Well, I have enough vocabulary to express the idea that I'm thinking of joining Terry. Look here, Mart. You feel so virtuous about wanting to go off and wear a flannel shirt and be peculiar and very, very pure. Suppose everybody argued that way. Suppose every father deserted his children whenever his nice little soul ached. Just what would become of the world? Suppose I were poor, and you left me, and I had to support John by taking in washing. It'd probably be fine for you, but fierce on the washing. No, I beg your pardon, that was an obvious answer. But I imagine it's just that argument that's kept almost everybody, all these centuries, from being anything but a machine for digestion and propagation and obedience. The answer is that very few ever do, under any condition, willingly leave a soft bed for a shanty bunk in order to be pure, as you very properly call it, and those of us that are pioneers, oh, this debate could go on forever. We could prove that I'm a hero or a fool or a deserter or anything you like, but the fact is, I've suddenly seen I must go. I want my freedom to work and I herewith quit whining about it and grab it. You've been generous to me. I'm grateful, but you've never been mine. Good-bye. Darling, darling, we'll talk it over again in the morning, when you aren't so excited, and an hour ago I was so proud of you. All right, good night. But before morning, taking two suitcases and a bag of his roughest clothes, leaving for her a tender note, which was the hardest thing he had ever written, kissing his son, and muttering, Come to me when you grow up, old man. He went to a cheap side-street hotel. As he stretched on the rickety iron bed, he grieved for their love. Before noon, he had gone to the institute, resigned, taken certain of his own apparatus and notes and books and materials, refused to answer a telephone call from Joyce, and caught a train for Vermont. Cramped on the red plush seat of the day coach, he who of late had ridden in silken private cars, he grinned with the joy of no longer having to toil at dinner parties. He drove up to Bertie's rest in a bobsled. Terry was chopping wood in a mess of chip-littered snow. Hello, Terry. Come for keeps. Fine, Slim. Say, there's a lot of dishes in the shack need washing. Part 2 He had become soft. To dress in the cold shanty and to wash in icy water was agony. To tramp for three hours through fluffy snow exhausted him. But the rapture of being allowed to work twenty-four hours a day without leaving an experiment at its juiciest moment to creep home for dinner of plunging with Terry into arguments as cryptic as theology, and furious as the indignation of a drunken man, carried him along, and he felt himself growing sinewy. Often he meditated, unyielding to Joyce, so far as to allow her to build a better laboratory for them, and more civilized quarters. With only one servant, though, or two at the very most, and just a simple decent bathroom, she had written, you have been thoroughly beastly, and any attempt at reconciliation, if that is possible now, which I rather doubt, must come from you. He answered, describing the ringing winter woods, and not mentioning the platform word, reconciliation. Part 3 They wanted to study further the exact mechanism of the action of their quinine derivatives. This was difficult with the mice, which Terry had contrived to use instead of monkeys because of their size. Martin had brought with him strains of Bacillus lepicepticus, which causes a pleuro-pneumonia in rabbits, and their first labor was to discover whether their original compound was effective against this bacillus as well as against pneumococcus. Profanely, they found that it was not. Profanely and patiently, they trudged into an infinitely complicated search for a compound that should be. 
they earned their living by preparing sira which rather grudgingly they sold to physicians of whose honesty they were certain abruptly refusing the popular drug vendors they thus received surprisingly large sums and among all clever people it was believed that they were too coyly shrewd to be sincere martin worried as much over what he considered his treachery to cliff clausen as over his desertion of joyce and john but this worrying he did only when he could not sleep regularly at three in the morning he brought both joyce and honest cliff to Bertie's rest and regularly at six when he was frying bacon he forgot them terry the barbarian once he was free of the tittering and success pawing of hollibird was an easy camp mate upper berth or lower was the same to him and till martin was hardened to cold and fatigue terry did more than his share of wood cutting and supply toting and with great melody and skill he washed their clothes he had the genius to see that they two alone shut up together season on season would quarrel he planned with martin that the laboratory scheme should be extended to include eight but never more maverick and undomesticated researchers like themselves who should contribute to the expenses of the camp by manufacturing sera but otherwise do their own independent work whether it should be the structure of the atom or a disproof of the results of doctors wicket and arrowsmith two rebels a chemist now caught in a drug firm and a university professor were coming next autumn it's kind of a miserable return to monasteries grumbled terry except that we're not trying to solve anything for anybody but our own fool selves mind you when this place becomes a shrine and a lot of cranks begin to creep in here then you and i got to beat it slim we'll move farther back in the woods or if we feel too old for that we'll take another shot at professorships or dawson hunziker or even the reverend dr hollibird for the first time martin's work began definitely to draw ahead of terry's his mathematics and physical chemistry were now as sound as terry's his indifference to publicity and to flowery hangings as great his industry as fanatical his ingenuity in devising new apparatus at least comparable and his imagination far more swift he had less ease but more passion he hurled out hypotheses like sparks he began incredulously to comprehend his freedom he would yet determine the essential nature of Fage, and as he became stronger and surer, and no doubt less human, he saw ahead of him in numerous inquiries into chemotherapy and immunity, enough adventures to keep him busy for decades. It seemed to him that this was the first spring he had ever seen and tasted. He learned to dive into the lake, though the first plunge was an agony of fiery cold. They fished before breakfast, they supped at a table under the oaks, they tramped twenty miles on end, they had blue jays and squirrels for interested neighbors, and when they had worked all night, they came out to find serene dawn lifting across the sleeping lake. Martin felt sun-soaked and deep of chest, and always he hummed. And one day he peeped out, beneath his new horn-rimmed, almost middle-aged glasses, to see a gigantic motor crawling up their woods road. From the car, jolly and competent in tweeds, stepped Joyce. He wanted to flee through the back door of the laboratory shanty. Reluctantly, he edged out to meet her. "'It's a sweet place, really,' she said, and amiably kissed him. "'Let's walk down by the lake.' In a still place of ripples and birch boughs, he was moved to grip her shoulders. She cried, Darling, I have missed you. You're wrong about lots of things, but you're right about this. You must work and not be disturbed by a lot of silly people. Do you like my tweeds? Don't they look wildernessy? You see, I've come to stay. I'll build a house near here, perhaps right across the lake. Yes, that will make a sweet place, over there on that sort of little plateau, if I can get the land. Probably some horrid, tight-fisted old farmer owns it. Can't you just see it? 
a wide low house with enormous verandas and red awnings. And visitors coming? I suppose so. Sometimes. Why? Desperately. Joyce, I do love you. I want awfully, just now, to kiss you properly. But I will not have you bringing a lot of people, and there'd probably be a rotten, noisy motor launch. Make our lab a joke. Roadhouse. New sensation. Why, Terry would go crazy. You are lovely, but you want a playmate, and I want to work. I'm afraid you can't stay. No. And our son is to be left without your care? He. Would he have my care if I died? He is a nice kid, too. I hope he won't be a rich man. Perhaps ten years from now he'll come to me here. And live like this? Sure, unless I'm broke. Then he won't live so well. We have meat practically every day now. I see. And suppose your Terry Wicket should marry some waitress or some incredibly stupid rustic. From what you've told me, he rather fancies that sort of girl. Well, either he and I would beat her together, or it would be the one thing that could break me. Martin, aren't you perhaps a little insane? Oh, absolutely. And how I enjoy it. Though you, you look here now, Joy. We're insane, but we're not cranks. Yesterday an esoteric healer came here because he thought this was a free colony, and Terry walked him twenty miles, and then I think he threw him in the lake. No, gosh, let me think. He scratched his chin. I don't believe we're insane. We're farmers. Martin, it's too infinitely diverting to find you becoming a fanatic, and all the while trying to wriggle out of being a fanatic. You've left common sense. I am common sense. I believe in bathing. Good-bye. Now you look here. By golly! She was gone, reasonable and triumphant. As the chauffeur maneuvered among the stumps of the clearing, for a moment Joyce looked out from her car, and they stared at each other through tears. They had never been so frank, so pitiful, as in this one unarmored look, which recalled every jest, every tenderness, every twilight they had known together. But the car rolled on unhalted, and he remembered that he had been doing an experiment. Part 4 On a certain evening of May, Congressman Almas Pickerbaugh was dining with the President of the United States. "'When the campaign is over, doctor,' said the President, "'I hope we shall see you a cabinet member, the first secretary of health and eugenics in the country. That evening, Dr. Rippleton Hollibird was addressing a meeting of celebrated thinkers assembled by the League of Cultural Agencies. Among the men of measured merriment on the platform were Dr. Aaron Schultes, the new director of McGurk Institute, and Dr. Angus Dewar, head of the Dewar Clinic and professor of surgery in Fort Dearborn Medical College. Dr. Hollibird's epical address was being broadcast by radio to a million ardently listening lovers of science. That evening, Bert Tozer of Wheatsylvania, North Dakota, was attending a midweek prayer meeting. His new Buick sedan awaited him outside, and with modest satisfaction he heard the minister gloat, "'The righteous, even the children of light, they shall be rewarded with a great reward, and their feet shall walk in gladness, saith the Lord of hosts. But the mockers, the sons of Belial, they shall be slain betimes, and cast down into darkness and failure, and in the busy marts they shall be forgot. That evening, Max Gottlieb sat unmoving and alone, in a dark small room above the banging city street. Only his eyes were alive. That evening, the hot breeze languished along the palm-waving ridge where the ashes of Gustav Sondeleus were lost among cinders, and a depression in a garden marked the grave of Leora. That evening, after an unusually gay dinner with Latham, Ireland, Joyce admitted, Yes, if I do divorce him, I may marry you. I know. He's never going to see how egotistical it is to think he's the only man living who's always right. That evening, 
Martin Arrowsmith and Terry Wickett lolled in a clumsy boat, an extraordinarily uncomfortable boat, far out on the water. "'I feel as if I were really beginning to work now,' said Martin. "'This new quinine stuff may prove pretty good. We'll plug along on it for two or three years, and maybe we'll get something permanent. And probably we'll fail.'" End of chapter 40 End of Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis Recording by Lee Smalley